Okay. In the name of God, we start this program. Neha, please start. Thank you, sir. Distinguished delegates, participating in Chess Nursicon 2022 from over 100 cities across India. A very pleasant good morning, a big hello, and a warm welcome to all of you. On behalf of Institute of Chest Surgery at Medanta and Departments of Nursing at Medanta Gurugram, Lucknow, Patna, Indore, and Ranchi, it's my proud privilege to welcome all of you to the first of its kind e-course in Essentials of Chest Surgery for Nurses. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a sense of humility as well as pride that I inform you we have crossed more than 4,500 registrations from all over the country for this conference. At this juncture, I wish to share that if your friends or colleagues faces any problem regarding joining on Zoom, then this program is also streaming live on YouTube. The link which is shared with all of you on your emails. Friends, chest diseases are on the rise across the country because of increasing incidence of smoking as well as pollution and increasing age of people and many other factors. All of us are encountering increasing number of patients in our day-to-day -day practice, not just in chest medicine or chest surgery, but across the hospital where patients with other diseases are also having chest morbidities. The Institute of Chest Surgery at Medanta has been in the forefront of developing medical expertise in the field of chest surgery, namely the country's first DNB in thoracic surgery. It was started by our department and it's one of the few departments in the country which is running this program today. Continuing with our efforts to percolate the same knowledge to the nurses, we now plan to go in the field of nursing with the aim of developing a super specialty of thoracic surgery nursing. As a first step towards that, we conceive this program that we are going to present in the next four hours a comprehensive overview of chest surgery. What are the components, including a panel discussion at the end. So I'm happy to announce that this is the first step in setting up the super speciality of thoracic surgery nursing in our country. With this welcome note, I would like to hand over to our first esteemed panel who are the chief nursing officers of the three units at Medanta, namely Gurugram, Lucknow, and Patna, who will be giving their perspective about why we are starting this program. To set the ball rolling, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Vinod. Mr. Vinod, presently Director Nursing at Medanta Gurugram. He is an alumni of Apollo Chennai, who completed his GNM and post basic course from IGNU and then completed his master's in nursing from Rajkumari Amrit College of Nursing. He's also an alumni of Indian School of Business, having done advanced management program in healthcare. Earlier, he was general manager and chief nursing officer at South Zone at Max Healthcare and worked as a director nursing with Aga Khan Health Services, Kenya, and Apollo Hospital, Ahmedabad. He also worked as a manager training and then as a head of learning in Indrapras, Apollo, Delhi. It's my honor to invite Mr. Vinod. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Nigar. Good morning and greetings from Medanta Gurugram to all of you who have joined this program. Now, I take this opportunity to thank Professor Dr. Arvind Kumar, who is the brain behind this program, and the entire team of Institute of Chest Surgery for creating this program and for the nurses in the country and across the world. Now, as we know that the world is moving towards super specialization, we at Medanta are committed to improve the skill sets and the competencies of our nurses to ensure our patients get the best and the 
best and safe patients care. Now, we almost have seen, I mean, Institute of Thoracic Surgery, Institute of uh, uh, Cardiovascular Surgery, and all those. So, this is something, a new concept and definitely a booming specialty of where chest surgery is moving towards a super specialization. And I can vouch and say that Medanta is probably the first hospital in the country to have a 50 plus bedded facility for chest surgery, which includes our ICU beds and the ward beds. And this specialty has also gained importance in the last two years, all of us know, because of the pandemic. And I'm proud and privileged to announce that Medanta is also the first hospital to start a super specialization program in thoracic surgery, I mean, for nurses in the country. Now, this program would go a long way in improving the standards of care for our patients. And we are definitely committed to share this knowledge across the world for all our nurses so that our patients get best possible care. I'm sure the program, I mean, for the uh, next four hours would be an interesting one because a lot of effort and a lot of thinking has gone behind creating this program and making it interesting to all our nurses. I urge and request each and everyone who attends this program to ensure that they put into practice whatever learning they have taken I mean, from this program. Without any delay, I would wish to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Priscilla, who is the Director of Nursing for Lucknow, Medanta. Priscilla has done her GNM and BSc from Mumbai, and she has a degree of MBA in hospital management. Priscilla has worked in hospitals like care hospitals in Hyderabad, Okad, and Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Hambani hospitals in Mumbai. She was also the senior nursing superintendent at Medanta Gurugram, and she's currently core member of Infection Control, Ethics Committee, Quality Assurance Committee, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Priscilla, my privilege to invite you for the next session. Good morning, one and all. Thanks, Vinod, for every word you said. Before I begin, my sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Arvind sir, our chairman, Chess Institute at Medanta, for wonderful thought on having chest con for nurses. Also, I would like to add, sir, that today, I think so, this is the largest population of nursing which has been joined for this uh, chest con and these beautiful memories are going to be with us and with all of us. I'm not having any doubt on that. As a given opportunity taking forward from Vinod sir, I would, uh, as uh, the crowd of nursing, nurses are here, I would like to um, uh, say as a leader of nursing that why specialization, there is a lot of debates has gone through last two decades that when nursing curriculum has uh, subjects to take care of the patient of medical and surgical, then why specialization? If you ask me, last 10 years, in, uh, as we all know at Medanta, we have started specialization and it works with us very well. Lot of nursing leaders and there were a lot of conferences we were having debate about it, but yes, as our experience, specialization is required. It empowers nurses. It gives you to expertise in one of your field. And also it advances your career. More important is your patient. If I hope that most of us are working in corporate sectors and the private sectors, most of us knows that so many patients are coming to us and saying that are you nurse is your nurses are able to handle our patient are they specialized they appreciate continuity of care in every specialization and it is the need of era that we have to focus and we all have to think about specializing in each and every field coming back to our chest con why thoracic nursing I think this is first time happening in our country. It is evolving. Super specialization thoracic nursing is very, very important. And I hope that we all of us, why can't you make your first nurse in your organization as a thoracic nurse? This is the opportunity for you, all of us, 
that we get certificate today and also we enroll for thoracic nursing which uh, under the leadership of uh, Mr. Vinod and also our chairman Dr. Arvind and uh, our team is going to look forward from you. Hope that all of you are going to enjoy the sessions today and also this ChaseCon will be uh, successful if you all when you go back to your ward and ICU, you are going to implement some of the uh, some of the uh, interesting protocols which you will hear today. You are going to implement in your unit, and that point, I think so. Uh, we all of us will be proud, and there is no uh, no time. Nobody is going to waste than enrolling for thoracic nursing. And uh, best of luck to all of you. Enjoy your day. Thanks once again. Now it's my privilege to introduce my next speaker, Ms. Sucharita Das, presently working as nursing superintendent at Jai Prabha Medanta Hospital, Patna. She completed her GNM and WBNC and post basic BSc and MSc from Ranchi University completed her MBA hospital administration from Vinayak Mission University. Also, she worked as CNO at Labat Cancer Hospital and Super Speciality Center, Bangladesh, Dhaka. Worked as assistant nursing director and then nursing superintendent at Medica Super Speciality Hospital, Kolkata. Worked as nursing superintendent at Kantilal Gandhi Medica Hospital, Jamshedpur and lot more. Over to you, Sucharita. Sucharita, unmute yourself, please. Good morning, uh, Priscilla, ma'am. And good morning, all of you. As my previous two speaker, Vinod sir and Priscilla, ma'am, has been correctly said that a change in the patient population leads to an inevitable in transformation in each and every healthcare sector. The role of a thoracic nursing specialty is a support and to educate patients who are actually suffering from the thoracic diseases to achieve the best outcome and the in terms of physical, psychological, social, and spiritual well-being. The care provided not only focuses on the hospital treatment the patient received, but also encompasses the whole patient journey, including lifestyle modification and the health concept promotion, self-empowerment, and the secondary prevention. We nurses as one of the pivotal member of the healthcare team need to be grow and go forward with as well together. The thoracic nursing team works very closely together with the other healthcare professionals and provides a quality care to patient, those patients who are suffering from thoracic disease. Despite of all advanced development of the medical treatment strategies and the nursing management approaches, post-operative nursing care and intervention, including complication monitoring and the early mobilization, etc., remain in the most important and essential care to ensure early complication-free rehabilitation. So continuous specialty training and the clinical audit are the key to maintain and uphold the standard of the quality care and which will be provided to the patient. And the today scientific program are based on all component and I am sure that you will enjoy these four hours and definitely gain desired skill and knowledge, which will be assured your patient quality care. And all of us now eagerly waiting to join in the scientific session with Dr. Arvind Kumar sir, and my sincere gratitude and thanks 
to doc, Dr. Arvind sir because he has organized such a good scientific evidence-based session for us. And now I uh, want to hand over the session to forward to Ms. Neha. Thank you so much once again. Ms. Neha, I'm handing over to the session to you, please. Uh, thank you, Sucharita, ma'am, Priscilla, ma'am, and Vinod, sir, for uh, your kind perspective regarding thoracic surgery nursing. Uh, now we should move towards the presentation part. And for the presentation part, I would like to first invite Dr. Professor Arvind Kumar. Professor Dr. Arvind Kumar is currently chairman, Institute of Chest Surgery, Chest Onco Surgery, and Lung Transplantation, and co chairman. Medanta Robotic Institute, Medanta, the Medicity Gurugram. He is former chairman, Center for Chest Surgery and director for Institute of Robotic Surgery at Sir Gangaram Hospital for a period of 2012 to 2020, and also former professor and head of chest surgery unit at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He joined AIMS in the 1976 as an MBBS student and after 35 years of service took voluntary retirement to move to Sir Gangaram Hospital in 2012. Dr. Kumar is a pioneer in chest surgery in India with the largest experience of open, keyhole and robotic chest surgery. He has pioneered the development of this neglected specialty in India by doing most of the procedures himself for the first time and then traveling across the country to teach other surgeons. He was the first to start an accredited DNB chest surgery program in India. He's a medical researcher and writer with over 150 papers in prestigious national and international medical journals. Considering his contribution to the medical field, Government of India awarded him the prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy Award for being eminent medical person of the year 2014. It was bestowed by the President of India. Apart from the clinical work, Professor Kumar has established a non-profit organization that is Lung Care Foundation with an aim to provide care and cure for 2.6 billion lungs in India. This foundation is dedicated to work for the dissemination of information about air pollution and various chest diseases to the masses. In the last two years of COVID crisis, we have seen Dr. Kumar as being a frontline warrior and has been very actively involved in creating awareness about COVID through over 100 webinars, hundreds of TV channel appearances, and dozens of videos released in public and write up in newspaper. It's my honor to invite Dr. Arvind. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Neha, for those very kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly, truly humbled at the massive nationwide love and affection shown by the nursing community from across the country. So I begin my talk by first bowing in front of all of you and saying we are humbled at the love and affection showered by you. We conceived this webinar just about two weeks back. And in the last two weeks till yesterday night, we had close to 4,700 people, nursing professionals from across the country, from Srinagar to Gujarat, and from uh, Silchar to Kolkata, from all parts of the country, 4,700 plus people. We have seniors from various institutions. We have principals and teaching faculty from numerous nursing training colleges across the country. And as a teacher, it makes me so happy to see that the nursing teachers are part of this program because if they 
imbibe this and then disseminate this i think we have sown a seed which will grow into a huge tree i consider 19th february 2022 as a landmark day in the history of thoracic surgical or thoracic nursing in india i think the massive massive participation that we have seen today 1000 people are logged in on the zoom rest are on the youtube live feed this shows that people consider this as an important specialty and they are eager to learn and as mr binod prasila and uh, sucharita have said that we are more than happy based on our 35 years of experience in this field of teaching training research and patient care we as a vedanta family are extremely extremely happy to be with all of you to take this movement forward so it's not just a conference i think this meeting is beginning of a thoracic surgical movement or revolution in the country and it's possible only and only because of you ladies and gentlemen who have joined this movement in huge numbers so once again i convey my humble humble greetings to all of you i cannot describe how happy i am to be conducting this seminar and this has been possible due to a joint efforts of all our units at gurugram at lucknow at patna indore and ranchi it's a collective effort of everyone with that introduction i now move to the formal presentation just give me a second okay am i visible on full screen okay so in the next uh, 30 minutes or so i'll quickly take you through the uh, overview of chest surgery but before i do that uh, i'm happy to briefly describe about the department so this is our department uh we have seven consultants in this department and five senior most of them are speaking in this webinar today but that's not all we have a full support staff we have a specialty manager mrs charu who looks after the entire department we have three specialty nurse coordinators and one of them neha is the coordinator of this program we have non medical coordinators we have a dedicated physiotherapist dipika who is a part of this program and i'm happy to share with you ladies and gentlemen that we have country's first dedicated 37 bedded chest surgery ward a four bedded hdu in the ward and 6 to 10 beds dedicated in the icu for chest surgery and two dedicated ot's working uh, 24 by 7 in terms of number of cases done in terms of number of faculty and in terms of the spectrum benign and malignant cases we do we are the largest thoracic surgery unit in india and our experience in keyhole surgery and robotic surgery is the largest in the country i'm also happy to share that apart from clinical work research and publication is an important part in this uh, department and in the last 2 years of covid time we had close to 50 publications in index journals and today out of any department we have largest number of publications in the field of chest surgery as neha said we started india's first dnb program but that's about clinical part i would take a few minutes to describe the 
the social work part also that all of us do with a lot of passion. So we have this Lung Care Foundation, which is created to spread awareness about chest diseases in India. We have been giving talks across the country, showing this picture of pink lung that we are born with and how pollution makes it black to show the effect of air pollution on various people. And I'm happy to share that this photograph has been presented across the globe from United Nations headquarter uh, to WHO headquarter and has circulated across the world. We wanted to highlight this and a couple of years back, we did a unique uh, experiment where we had 5,000 students from various schools of Delhi assemble. This picture of lung that you see is not a photo. These are 5,000 children sitting in a football stadium forming the shape of a lung. This was a Guinea's world record of largest human image of an organ which created ripples across the world and took us to United Nations headquarters as well as WHO headquarters for invited talk. So this was our way of spreading awareness amongst the people about the ill effect. We also did a very unique experiment a uh, couple of years back where we created a lung replica, a replica on the shape of lung, and we put an exhaust fan using HEPA filter paper and put an exhaust fan behind it and put it in the open space to mimic the process of breathing. And in a few days time, this white lung turned into black lung and we displayed to people that this is exactly what's happening inside your lungs also. Another important thing I wish to share is that asthma is increasing in schools and we wrote an asthma manual for schools initially in English, but it was translated into 12 different Indian languages and is being used in schools across the country. So these are some of the major initiatives that we have done under the banner of Lung Care Foundation. This is apart from the clinical work that we do. So with that brief introduction about the department and about our social initiatives, I will, in the next 15, 20 minutes, I'll quickly take you through the various diseases that are included in, this, in the uh, super specialty called thoracic surgery. Unfortunately, a lot of people have this notion that chest surgery means TB surgery. Chest is synonymous with TB. And people just can't visualize that chest surgeon may be doing anything other than TB also. So today, I want to tell that there is a lot, lot, lot more beyond TB that a chest surgeon handles. And in the next 10 minutes, I'll quickly run you through these. I'm not going into details because I have a limited time, but I'll just mention, just to bring it to the notice of my nursing colleagues from across the country. And I know that a large number of nursing students are also joined in. So I'm going to mention these names of diseases so that it sticks in your mind that, okay, these are the diseases which occur in the chest. You will also see some of the photographs. And at the end, I will show you a video of how different, different procedures are done. What is open surgery? What is video assisted surgery? What is robotic surgery? So let's start the journey. As you know, chest means inside the chest, we have lungs, we have trachea and two bronchi. The lungs are surrounded by pleura. Between the two lungs, we have mediastinum. On the posterior side, we have esophagus. We have chest wall, which is consists of 12 pairs of ribs on the sides, sternum in front, and the, the uh, spine behind. We have diaphragm. We have a lot of trauma occurring to the chest and various. So let's quickly run through all these problems. In lungs, there are a lot of problems that occur, but one that I want to highlight right in the beginning is lung cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, because of increasing incidence of pollution, lung cancer is on the rise. It's occurring more, it's occurring in younger people, it's occurring in women. And yesterday I saw a 19 year old boy 
with a metastatic lung cancer. It was horrifying. Before that, 29 years was the youngest I'd seen. Apart from cancer, we have benign diseases like bronchitis, aspergilloma, high dated and other cysts, various kinds of bully and depth, nodules, and of course, you can get lung injury. So this is how a chest X-ray and CT looks in a case of lung cancer. This is the picture of a lobectomy for lung cancer. You can see this cancerous growth here. This is how the CT scan of a patient with bronchiectatic. So this is the normal lung on right side, and this is a bronchiectatic patch. I'm just showing you some CTs and some pictures to, to dispel the notion that TB is the only thing in chest. There is a lot more in the chest. Now, these are cystic lesions. So this is one of the cysts. This is how a dermoid cyst looks from inside. Then you have various other kinds of cystic lesions. This is how a destroyed lung. So this was an abscess which destroyed this lung. So this is how a destroyed lung looks like. Now, this is an aspergilloma. Many a times you will hear this term aspergilloma, which is a fungal ball inside a pre-existing cavity in the lung. And I just want to show you this video, what this fungal ball looks like. See here, this is actually a lobectomy specimen. There was a cavity there and see this fungus ball. This is nothing but shit. This is what forms inside the lung as a fungus ball. So if you hear the term aspergilloma, visualize this image that you have seen today. Then so these are the various diseases we see in lungs. Then trachea bronchus has, can have cancers, can have carcinoids, which can occur in the proximal part or can occur at carina. Because of increasing accidents, these are, we are seeing more and more cases of injury, that is rupture of the trachea. And just about a month back, we handled an eight-year-old boy who was riding a cycle. He fell down. His, uh, the handle hit his neck and he got injury and rupture of the trachea needing immediate intubation and later on tracheal repair. These days, a lot of people are on prolonged intubation. They have tracheostomy and this is leading to increasing incidence of tracheal stenosis. So tumors, trauma and stenosis, these are the things we handle in trachea and bronchus. And then, so this is how it looks, starting from larynx down to the distal segment, anywhere the disease can occur. So this is how a carinal tumor would look. If we were to resect it, we will cut the trachea here, cut the bronchus here and here. So this is how it will look. Then we will join the true bronchi together and join the two bronchi to the trachea to form what we call neocarina. So these are very, very complex surgeries, but we do them routinely. We always try to save the lungs. So please remember in benign diseases or even in tumors, you should try and save the lungs. So when we have tumors at critical areas, we try to do all kinds of permutation combinations and try and save the lung. These are called lung parenchyma preserving surgeries or sleeve resection in which we resect the sleeve and do all kinds of complex reconstruction. Now that was about lung and trachea. Now coming to pleura, pleura can have pleural effusion, which is fluid around the lungs, or it can be clotted hemothorax, which is blood around the lungs, or it could be empyma, which is pus around the lungs, or it could be tumor in the pleura, which is mesothelioma, or it could be chylothorax, which is milky fluid, chyle in the thorax, or it could be air around the lungs, which is pneumothorax. So pneumothorax, chylothorax, mesothelioma, empyema, clotted hemothorax, pleural effusion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a huge range of diseases which occur in the pleura. And I'm happy to share that we have a huge experience and majority of the cases in our department are handled by banks. My colleagues are absolutely proficient in this, and they have actually taken it absolutely to a different level. 
So these are various plural diseases. Pneumothorax I mentioned, which occurs because of what is called bleb. So you see here, this is the normal lung, and you see this abnormal outpouching. This is what is bleb. This is how it looks like. When it ruptures, it causes pneumothorax, and these people present with chest pain and breathlessness, and then they have problems. This is another example of the same. So we've covered lung, trachea and bronchus, we've covered pleura. Now coming to between the lungs, the area between the lungs is mediastinum, which has the thymus gland in the anterior mediastinum and the neural tissue on the backside. In the thymus gland, you can have a disease called myasthenia gravis, in which you have weakness in the muscles, or this gland can have a tumor called thymoma. Both these are rare diseases, but we've had a special interest in this for over 25 years. And I'm happy to share again and humbled to share that we have the largest experience in the country in robotic and keyhole surgery for myasthenia gravis as well as thymoma. When you go to the posterior side, you can have neurogenic tumors. And of course, in the middle, there are a lot of lymph nodes around the trachea subcarinal area, hypothylum, paratracheal areas, those are mediastinal lymph nodes, which may be involved by tuberculosis, lymphoma, cancer, fungal infection, and various diseases. So it's a huge number of diseases where we are involved. So this is what a thymus gland is lying in front of the heart, but uh, which can be cause of diseases. This is how a chest X-ray in a posterior mediastinal tumor will look. And this is how a posterior mediastinal tumor looks. We do most of these cases by the keyhole methods. Another posterior mediastinal tumor, majority of these are benign. So we've covered lung, we've covered pleura, we've covered trachea and bronchus, and we've covered anterior mediastinum. In the posterior mediastinum, we have esophagus, which can develop strictures due to ingestion of acid or alkali. A lot of toilets these days have acid and alkali lying, and children sometimes swallow it accidentally. The incidence of cancer is increasing. Many cases have tracheoesophageal fistula. Acid reflux with or without hiatus hernia is increasing, and we are also seeing an increasing number of perforation trauma cases coming to us. So these are the various diseases that we have. Someone has his uh, mic on, please mute yourself. Thank you. Then coming to the chest ball. So these are the, so we've covered lung, we've covered pleura, we've covered mediastinum, we've covered, uh, uh, now we come to the chest ball. Chest wall can be site of tumor. So this is one tumor, big tumor you can see here. And see, when we operate, we go around the tumor, wide away from the tumor, and resect the ribs along with the tumor with a clear margin. Obviously, it leaves a large defect. You can see, this is the lung, and this is the diaphragm here, which is left here. And this is the kind of defect which is there. You can see, then we reconstruct this defect using a mesh, and then we involve plastic surgeons to take a myocutaneous flap and cover it up with a myocutaneous flap. And although it looks very grotesque on the table, but patients ultimately do very well. So this is how the tumor looks. This is from inside, that is from outside. You can see one, two, three, four, four ribs have been resected. Another patient, sometimes this tumor can occur in the sternum, and then you have to resect the whole of sternum and reconstruct it by various methods. So these are all diseases which we handle. Then lastly, coming to diaphragm, diaphragm can be site of eventration or site of hernia. Both these need surgical repair. Most of these we are doing these days by robotic or keyhole method. Apart from this, chest is also involved in trauma. And sadly, I'm very sorry to share this, that when people die in road accident, especially on-site deaths, majority of those deaths are because of trauma in the chest. It's the chest trauma which leads to those instant deaths. 
So therefore, and sometimes these patients are brought to hospitals. So commonest problem is multiple rib fractures. Anything from one rib to 10, 11 ribs may be fractured, associated with pneumothorax, hemothorax, respiratory compromise, collapsed lung, patient going on ventilator, all kinds of problems are there in these patients. And sometimes you have these kind of grotties situation seen in the casualty with a knife going into the chest of an individual. So trauma today is forming an important part of our chest care. So this was about the range of diseases. I'm sure you all will agree that we do a lot more than just tuberculosis. Thoracic surgery started from tuberculosis, but today there's much more. How do we now, coming to my second part, how do we go inside? Now, this will be dealt with in more detail by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Bilal. So I've just shown this picture that lungs are protected by this chest wall. So when you have to go inside for open surgery, you have to put your hand inside. So you have no choice but to make a cut and to separate these ribs to be able to put your hands inside. And I'm going to show you uh, three videos now a thoracotomy video, a video of video assisted thoracic surgery, and a video of robotic surgery to tell you how we handle these various lesions which I have shown to you. So let's start this video. So patient is anesthetized. We use a special tube to drop the lung on that side. And then you make this skin incision first. After skin, you go to the subcutaneous tissue. And then you have these thick chest wall muscles which need to be cut. So using an electrocautery, you cut these muscles till you ultimately reach the chest wall. So you can see here, we have reached the chest wall. Now you divide the intercostal muscles to cut the intercostal muscles and then you gain entry. Now see here, then you take this chest retractor now I'll pause here. So this chest retractor has got two spatulas and we literally hold the ribs and pull them away from each other to create at least eight, 10 centimeter space. So ribs had one centimeter space in between. They are pulled away from each other to create this eight to 10 centimeter space. You can imagine when a bony structure is pulled eight to 10 centimeter away from its normal position, what will happen? It will break, it will fracture. Friends, that's exactly what happens to the ribs when we do open surgery. So having done the surgery, what do we do now? We have to restore normalcy. So what you do, you remove this retractor and you get what is called, so this is called rib spreader because it spreads the rib and then you get something called rib contractor. This is rib contractor, which gets the ribs back into normal position, and then you suture it, and then you close the muscles, and then ultimately, this is how it looks. So length of incision, of course, is an issue, but the biggest issue is that there is a lot of rib spreading. And similarly, when you go from the front side, you have to do what is called sternotomy, in which to cut the entire sternum into two parts using a saw and then do the surgery and then rejoin it back into normal position. And then that's how it looks at the end. This is how it looks. So these are giving you excellent exposure, but friends, they cause severe pain post-op, prolonged ICU stay, long time to recovery, blood requirements, cosmetically poor, and most important, these patients take several, several weeks to months to return to normalcy because of the trauma you caused to the chest. So if we want to reduce the trauma, what do we do? And this thoracotomy was only to allow your hand to go inside to do the operation. So the solution is if we can get instruments into the chest to do the same operation without hands going inside, we can reduce the size of the incision. And that's exactly what minimal access surgery is. So in keyhole surgery, we do that. And chest has two names. I want you to remember this. VATS, which is Video Assisted Thoracic Surgery. 
and when we do it in the neck, it's called cervical mediastinoscopy. So now let me show you a video of how we do that. You saw how incision was made for thoracotomy. Now we are making a small incision, just opening the wound, and we put this one centimeter trocar into the chest, which has gone inside and given you a hole. And then through that hole, you have your telescope with camera, which you put inside. It goes inside and gives you a beautiful, magnified view of inside of the chest. Everything you see magnified. You can see this is the collapsed lung. All the structures in the chest are visible here. So initially you put one port and then you put more ports for putting instruments and then you can do the procedure. So you can imagine that instead of retracting the ribs, there is no rib retraction here. How does it look from outside? So this is my colleague, Dr. Mohan, who's doing uh, one of the procedures. You can see movement from outside. He's not opened the chest. He's not looking at the patient. You can see he's looking at the TV monitor. There is a TV monitor in front of him and there is a TV monitor behind him, which is for the assistant who's standing on this side so that they don't have to turn their neck. And just by using these instruments going in through these small holes, you can see on the TV monitor, he's trying to do a lung nodule excision. So this is a can spatula which is holding the lung and then a stapler will be applied on it and this will be fine. So this is how the video assisted thoracic surgery looks from outside and it's such a friendly thing from in, for the patient. But there are some drawbacks. You lose 3D vision. I see 3D, but here you see only 2D because TV, you can only see length and breadth, nothing more than that. So this is the kind of incision you have with thoracotomy. This is the kind of incision you have with sternotomy, but you have these small, small incisions with thoracoscopy. But so this leads to less post-op pain, less requirement for analgesics, less complications in the lung, shorter hospital stay, quicker return to work, of course, cosmetically superior. To my mind, two most important issues are less post-operative pain, and a very quick return to normalcy. So after a typical VATS procedure, patients are able to join back their work in two weeks' time. Nobody asks for medical leave, but there are drawbacks. We lose 3D vision to 2D. Instruments have limitations, and we may not be able to do everything. So what do we do? So we brought robotics for that to counter and to overcome some of the uh, uh, drawbacks of VATS. Now, many people think that robot is something like this humanoid robot who will walk into the theater and do the procedure. No, friends. Reality is this. This is the surgical robot. It's got three components. It's got this real robot, which is actually a stand. I'll show you a video with these three or four arms, which are the actual arms of the robot. Now, these are connected to a, a, a console by a fiber cable, and the surgeon sits on this console, man, manages and operates through two, a pair of joysticks, and looks in this viewfinder, he gets a 3D vision. And of course, we have, so this is the close-up view of the console. You have these through joysticks, the surgeon sits on a chair, all the controls are at his feet, and he looks here in the viewfinder and gets a 3D vision. And this is how you put your fingers into the uh, 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 joysticks to, to manipulate this. And this is how it's connected to the patient. So this gives us 3D view, and it's almost like your hands being inside. The instruments have got a wrist function here, which allows you to do manipulation just as you would do in the hand. It allows you to access the inaccessible areas. You have steady camera control and you are operating while sitting on a chair comfortably. So let's see how the robotic surgery looks like. So here, a patient has been anesthetized. Uh, this was uh, surgery done by my colleague, Dr. Bilal. So he's now making the 
ports here. So one port has been made, you make more ports. We always put local anesthesia before we put these ports. So the first step is to make the ports. And then the next step is while you are making the ports, in the meantime, your scrub nurse will drape. So this is the real robot. And these arms are covered by the sterile plastic tape. So this is called preparing or draping the robot. So this is now ready. It's on a platform. And now you will see that Dr. Bilal is wanting the, the robot car to come from a particular angle. This depends, this varies from surgery to surgery. So you get these arms near to the patient. And now you have to connect this arm to the pro car so that the pro cars now are ready for the instruments to be put. So one arm is connected, second arm is connected. Now these are very, very specialized instruments. And then the camera here, the telescope is a special 3D telescope, which gives you 3D HD vision on the monitor. And these instruments are also special. So you put the telescope, you put the instruments inside, and then you press buttons so that the machine is now ready. Dr. Blal has completed this, uh, what is called docking procedure. And then now, so this was all done with you scrubbed up. Now you remove your gloves and gown and there is no need for sterility because you are going to go and sit on the console. So you de-scrub now and then you walk towards the console, sit on the console and do the procedure while sitting on the console. So this is now the console on which we sit. You sit on the chair, you rest your hands on this platform, you hold these joysticks and you look here in the viewfinder, a 3D vision. And then looking at the monitor, uh, looking at the monitor, you do the surgery. The other people in the OT will be getting a vision on the TV monitors inside the theater, but you are seeing in the screen. And the whole procedure is done by manipulating these two joysticks. So friends, I want you to see this. You don't actually do surgery directly on the patient. You sit on a console and manipulate these joysticks. And this information is conducted through the cable, fiber cable. And that leads to actions on the side of the patient. So friends, I've told you about the diseases that occur in the lungs, trachea and bronchus, pleura, mediastinum, esophagus, chest wall, diaphragm, trauma cases to the chest. And I have also shared with you how we have moved from doing open surgery to video assisted thoracic surgery to robotic surgery. It's been a journey of 30 years, but we stand committed to offer the best and the latest to our patients with all chest diseases. Friends, this is a very important slide because for us in this department, chest surgery is not a profession. It's a passion. It's a fire which burns in the heart of each and every one of us in this department. And it is this fire which was the starting point for creating this webinar today. So I bring you greetings once again from Institute of Chest Surgery at Medanta and the entire Medanta family. And with that, my presentation ends. I tried to show you a glimpse of the procedures that we do in the chest, the way we do it, and the various diseases that we find in the chest. Uh, what we are planning is that uh, a large number of people are with us on the YouTube. On the about 1,000 people who are with us on the Zoom, you will have a lot of questions. The questions are to be sent to us. We will answer each and every question. But questions should be sent on the Q&A chat. When you go to the bottom of the screen, you will see two uh, uh, icons there, chat and Q&A. Chat is for saying hi, hello, but put your questions in the Q&A chat. Right now, I'll be moving to the next talk, but 
we will have a ample time at the end i will be looking at the questions coming in the q and a and we will make sure that each and every question will be answered to your satisfaction we also wish to tell you that the entire program is being recorded and it will be put on the youtube and the link of that youtube will be shared with all of you on your mail ids a lot of people are asking about the certificates well we are happy to share the certificate with you all those who are joining today and we have their ids on zoom as well as we have a way of tracking them on the youtube all those who are with us will be given certificate all those who are in the auditoriums at various hospitals will also get certificate so please don't bother about writing because you will get the recording please don't bother about certificate we are happy to share the certificate with you with that we move to the next part of our presentation and it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague dr bilal bin asaf with whom i started this journey in 2010 he joined me at the all india institute in 2010 and since then we progressed we created this journey together he is currently associate director institute of chest surgery at medanta he was a consultant with us at center for chest surgery and i'm happy to share that when we started india's first dnb thoracic surgery it was me and him two of us who actually started this journey together in january 2014 and our precious students are now part of uh, our family whom dr bilal will be introducing completed his mbbs and ms from aligarh muslim university he is recognized nationwide as an expert and a leader in minimally invasive and robotic surgery you've so seen that i showed the video where he was operating he has special interest in key hole surgery that is vats procedures for lung cancer esophageal cancer myasthenia gravis and thymoma he also has research interest uh, outside of the of the uh, usual clinical work and i'm happy to share that he's been a co-author in more than 7 books and he has more than 40 publications to his credit at this young age he is also one of my co-founder trustees in the lung care foundation he is actually like a younger brother to me uh, bilal it's a pleasure for me to hand over the mic to you bilal thank you so much sir for the generous introduction it is indeed a very very uh, important day for all of us in the thoracic surgery fraternity uh on this particular day where we are extending uh, our knowledge uh, uh, and making nurses uh, as one of our knowledge partners because we understand the role that uh, nursing plays uh, in management of thoracic surgery patients and it cannot be over emphasized that each uh, nursing uh, individual who takes care of a thoracic surgery patients takes a step towards making the patient uh, a much 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 uh, 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 improved uh, um health uh, level so in 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 order to understand what is thoracic surgery uh, that uh, has already been explained uh, very nicely by professor dr arvind kumar i will be briefly taking you through uh, uh, what is known as the anatomy and physiology of uh, thoracic surgery and uh, uh, my presentation topic uh, is very vast but uh, for the sake of simplicity i've kept it uh, uh, to a very simplistic uh, presentation wherein you can understand the various uh, aspects of thorax and that will give you a, a better understanding uh, of uh, the uh, the thoracic anatomy as, as well as physiology and it will help you uh, develop uh, uh, patient care skills as well as your knowledge in um, uh, in thoracic surgery so i'll be taking you briefly uh, through the function which means the physiology and the structure now i won't be taking this as a separate uh, uh, part like physiology will be separate or anatomy will be separate we'll be going side by side i'll uh, tell you the organs and i'll tell you the functions and i'll briefly describe about the clinical implications of this knowledge uh, uh, when you're taking care of a patient in thoracic surgical ward 
So uh, starting off with uh, what is the function of the respiratory system? Now here I'm talking about the respiratory system. We have uh, one of the major function of the respiratory system is a mechanical function wherein we uh, want the oxygen or containing air to go inside the, uh, the lungs and we want the uh, carbon dioxide and other gases uh, to be exhaled out. So this is one of the function, which is a mechanical function. As you can see in both these images, uh, there is an inhalation happening. The lung is expanding, air is going inside, and also the air is coming outside when we exhale out. So the basic function is one is mechanical function. The other uh, function is gas exchange. Now, once the air goes into the lungs, it is important for the oxygen rich air to transfer its oxygen into the bloodstream and then take out the carbon dioxide which is there uh, from the deoxygenated blood into the exhaled air. Now this is known as the gas exchange which happens at the level of the pulmonary parenchyma or at the lung level. Now this is a, a sort of a chemical uh, uh, process and a physical process and right until now we were talking about a mechanical uh, movement of air. Now, the other important uh, aspect of uh, uh, the respiratory system, which is uh, where the circulatory system support us, is to take the deoxygenated blood, which means the blood which is containing high amount of carbon dioxide and low uh, uh, oxygen because of being utilized uh, by various organs. All this blood comes to the right side of the heart and then through the pulmonary arteries, this blood go into the lungs. And once the, lung, the blood is oxygenated, it goes back through the pulmonary vein into the left side of the heart, which then distributes it through the aorta into the various parts of the body. So this is how the uh, deoxygenated blood, which comes from rest of the, uh, all the body to the heart is then oxygenated into the lungs and uh, 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 given back to the uh, rest of the body. So how does uh, these functions take place? These functions take place with the help of all these organs. So I'll be briefly taking you through uh, the nasopharynx, the thoracic, the chest wall, uh, what are the thoracic cavity and it's, uh, what are the divisions, and some important organs that we very uh, commonly encounter uh, 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 during our surgical practice. So I have been uh, focusing not on all the organs, including the nerves or muscles and everything, but what I've done is uh, tried to limit it to important uh, uh, organs so that your understanding is easier and simplistic. So starting with the nose and the pharynx, we know that the uh, air that we breathe is through the mouth or through the nose, but it's preferable that we breathe the air through the nose because the mechanism there is that once the air goes into the nasal, cav uh, nasal orifices and then goes into the nasal cavity, it is lined by a thin walled uh, mucus uh, uh, membrane, which has thin walled blood, blood vessels in it. Now the function of these blood vessels is to warm the air. And also the mucus has, uh, the, the, the membrane has mucus as well as cilia, which lead to trapping of, uh, you know, impurities, in, including uh, uh, microorganisms as well as dust particles. So what basically the nasopharynx or the nas uh, and it does for us is uh, it actually uh, purifies the air, it warms the air, it works like an air conditioner uh, for the rest of the body. And once we go down the track, we know that the um, overfanning uh, becomes a common uh, area where the air as well as the food comes. And then we divide it, uh, it divides into the food track and the wind uh, track, which means the wind pipe and the food pipe, uh, that is the trachea and the esophagus. Now, what is thorax? When we we have been talking about uh, thorax or, or the whole uh, uh, since the start of the program, we must understand the thorax is a part of the body which starts from the root of the neck. So here you can see the root of the neck here, and it ends where the lower part of the rib ends, which means it is uh, a, a, from the inside it ends at the level of the diaphragm. So this is the front view and this is the back view. Uh, it is consisting of various. Uh, uh, is my slides visible? Yes, so this, your slides are visible. Okay. Uh, there was a small gap here, so sorry for that. Uh, anyways, no, no, your slides so, are visible. So, so what we see here is that we have the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And when we go inside, we find the muscles. Once we have uh, crossed the muscles, we'll uh, see the bony chest wall. And then there are internal organs. The bony chest wall uh, plays a very, very important role in protecting very important organs uh, inside the chest. So the lungs, the heart, and all the major blood vessels are all protected by this uh, bony cage. Now let us look at this uh, bony cage uh, a little bit more closely. Now, what is sternum? Sternum is very commonly known as the breastbone, which is the bone uh, which is present right here in the midline of the chest in front of us. 
uh, it is broadly divided into uh, the manubrium, the body, and you can see it has notches on either side where the ribs are attached to it. So the, the basic uh, uh, structure of the is to protect uh, the, and it's a very tough bone and it protects us, uh, the heart and the underlying structures from any kind of trauma because it forms a rigid uh, structure around it. And all the ribs attach uh, to the sternum. And as we can see, we'll, I'll be telling you about the ribs and what are the two ribs and false ribs in subsequent slides. But this is a brief description of what is the sternum. Right, and then we have move on to the ribs. Now we have twelve pa uh, pairs of ribs, twelve on each side. So we can see that these are divided into uh, true ribs and false ribs based on their attachment. So the ribs uh, they start from the posterior part, which means the back of the chest, where they are attached to the vertebral column, and then they curve around and form, and then ultimately attach to the notches that I showed you earlier on the sternum. Now, when we divide these ribs into true ribs and false ribs, now what do we mean by that is the true ribs are the ones which are attached on the uh, vertebral column on the back and they attach directly to the sternum uh, uh, in the front. So you can see that from first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh ribs, they are getting attached directly to the sternum and that is why they are known as the true ribs. The remaining ribs, uh, eight to 12 ribs are known as the false ribs uh, uh, amongst them. Uh, the 11th and 12th ribs are the free or the floating ribs. You can see here, uh, these are the floating ribs. They are not attached to any um, part. The rest of the ribs, uh, which means the 9th, 10th uh, uh, rib, they attach to the sternum through this costal cartilage. So you can see the first seven ribs attached directly. The rest of the two, uh, the rest of the ribs attached through uh, the costal cartilages of the above ribs, and the last two ribs, which are the eleventh and the twelfth ribs, are free floating ribs, which are not attached to anything. Now, when we talk about this uh, um, uh, rib anatomy, we must understand uh, that this is the area where the rib fractures happen. So, if there is a trauma, uh, blunt trauma to the chest, uh, the these are the rib fractures uh, will happen on the, these structures, and that is why. Uh, and these are very important in allowing us uh, to breathe. What happens is the, in the, the space between the ribs is uh, covered by the intercostal muscles. And there are additional muscles, including the diaphragm. When we breathe in, the, these uh, ribs move in a bucket handle fashion. So if you can look at my uh, uh, arms, so the bucket handle fashion, these ribs move out like that. And when they move out like that, the internal uh, volume of the chest increases. And what it does, it creates a suction and brings in air uh, inside the chest. So it, these ribs are very, very important uh, uh, for the normal breathing mechanism. Now, as Sir has uh, very uh, aptly pointed out and very uh, uh, nicely shown all the various methods of uh, doing thoracic surgery, I will be briefly talking about some of the commonly used incisions in thoracic surgery. Now, these are the incisions that we use for accessing various kind of organs. Now, the very common and the most common incision that you will encounter in your uh, thoracic surgery uh, practice is uh, the uh, the posterior lateral thoracotomy by posterior lateral which means the patient is lying on the side with the side to be operated up uh, up and we make an incision starting from the back of the patient and it goes along onto the side of the patient to the almost to the front of the patient this is the incision which is known as the posterior lateral thoracotomy uh, now these incisions are used for various kind of lung surgeries mainly and various kind of uh, other procedures, including the diaphragmatic surgeries. However, if there is a uh, 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 organ which needs uh, to be addressed, like uh, the anterior mediastinum or in the region of the heart, then we need to access this lesion while the patient is lying flat on its back. And when uh, in these cases, we open up the chest using uh, the sternotomy incision, wherein we cut the breastbone in the midline and open the breastbone in order to access these lesions. So this is the mid sternotomy or the sternotomy incision. And as we move on, uh, we have what is known as the anterolateral thoracotomy. So this is just the opposite of uh, the posterior lateral thoracotomy. In posterior lateral thoracotomy, the patient is lying on the side of the table, um, on his side, whereas in anterolateral thoracotomy, the patient is lying on its back. So you can see that this is the incision that we make. These are used for various other procedures, uh, which are not accessible by a posterior lateral thoracotomy. Now, sometimes we need to access both sides of the chest, particularly in cases if you've heard about lung transplantation, we use this kind of incision when we use when we need access to both sides of the chest cavity. Now, in these cases, we do two anterolateral incisions and then join them in the midline, cut through the sternum bone, as you can see here, and then use the chest spreaders to open the chest. So it opens the chest 
like a clamshell. And this is how uh, uh, it looks. So this is a very extensive incision, but is very commonly used uh, when both side uh, access to both side of the pleural cavity is required. So another modification of this uh, uh, incision is the hemi clamshell. Here we do not open both sides of the chest. We just open one side of the chest. So we cut the uh, um, breastbone in the middle, and then we take this incision across to the affected side, which we want to operate upon. Moving on to thoracic cavity and its division. I've made it very simple and I've tried to explain it in very simple words. So I, we will be looking at, uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, if you're standing on the front of the patient and the patient is looking ahead at you. So when look from the front, you will find that the thoracic uh, uh, cage is uh, un uh, underlying the thoracic cage are three major cavities. Now this is when we are looking from front of the patient. Uh, so we have a pleural cavity, which is uh, on both the sides. So the right and the left pleural cavity. And we have in the midline what is known as the pericardial cavity. So the pleural cavity contains the lung and the uh, blood vessels along with it. And the, uh, the right and the left lung are encased in the pleural cavity. Whereas in the pericardial cavity, you can see uh, there is the heart is there and all the major blood vessels are there. And also in the superior part of the uh, this cavity is what is known as the mediastinum area, which I'll be explaining in the subsequent slides. Now, when we look at the patient from the side, so if you're standing on uh, the patient is facing away from you towards the wall and you're looking at the patient from the side, either the right or the left side, uh, you can see that there are three uh, or four broad cav uh, cavities that you can see. So what is it? These are potential spaces where various organs are placed. And this is known as the mediastinum. Now, this mediastinum can be divided into the anterior mediastinum. Anterior mediastinum is the area between the sternum and the heart or the pericardial cavity. This is known as the anterior mediastinum. The middle mediastinum is the area which in, enhance, which uh, uh, contains the heart and the major blood vessels, the pericardial cavity, as you can see here. And then there is a posterior mediastinum wherein the windpipe, the food pipe, and the various nerves are there, uh, which is just next to the vertebral column. And so these three areas are from front to back. And then there is one area above the pericardial cavity, which I was talking about in the earlier slide, uh, this area, uh, which is known as the superior mediastinum. So this is the broad division of the thoracic cavity. Now, various uh, organs are placed in the superior mediastinum, which, which we access very frequently when they get disease. So the organs of importance in the superior mediastinum is the thymus trachea and esophagus. The organs of importance in anterior mediastinum is again thymus uh, and uh, various internal, uh, uh, various arteries and, uh, and its branches. The middle mediastinum we know is uh, cons consists of the heart and also the major vessels which arise uh, out of the heart and go into it. Uh, also, it has the trachea and the division of the right and left uh, uh, main uh, bronchus, which is the division of the windpipe. There are various uh, important arteries in this area, which are the ascending aorta, the pulmonary trunk. These are all major important arteries. So, if you, uh, 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 which is very important to know. Now, the posterior mediastinum, this area, as we talked about, it contains the esophagus, the food pipe, the descending thoracic aorta, which supplies blood uh, to various parts of the body, and various veins and nerves are there, which are important in uh, uh, function. So moving on to important organs in the thorax. Uh, so of, of heart, lung, airways, pleura, diaphragm, and esophagus are the important organs. Uh, just a brief description of heart. We have a four-chambered heart. The right side of the heart can, uh, deals with the deoxygenated blood, which is shown in blue here. The left side of the heart deals in uh, oxygenated blood, which is shown in uh, red here. So basically, the deoxygenated blood is pushed to the lung. And once the lung oxygenates the blood, it pushes it back to the heart on the left side. And from the left side, the oxygenated blood then goes to the rest of the body. This is how our lungs look like. We have two lungs, the right and the left lung, which consists of an apical area, which is the top part of the lung, just beneath the clavicle area. And it has a basal area. And as you can see, it has divisions uh, based on fissures, which divide the lung into the right lung into three parts and the left lung into two parts. The right lung uh, consists of the right upper lobe or the superior lobe, the middle lobe and the inferior lobe. On the left side, we have two lobes. We can see the upper lobe and the lower lobe. So when we talk about uh, uh, why do we need to know about these lobar distributions and segmental distribution is that when we do surgeries, 
if you take a simple non uh, anatomical kind of a wedge of the lung and we take it out it is known as a wedge resection when we take a segment segment is a part of the lobe which has its own blood supply it has its own uh, 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 air supply which is the bronchus so that part if we are removing this is known as a segmentectomy if we remove the whole lobe it is known as a lobectomy and if we remove one of the whole lung uh, 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 then it is known as a, a pneumonectomy uh, uh, so it could be either a right pneumonectomy or a left pneumonectomy. So based on what lobe is removed, it can be a right upper lobe, right middle lobectomy, or right lower lobectomy, or it could be a left upper and left lower lobectomy. Uh, this is the blood supply of the heart. I've already explained it. Just quickly tell you again that uh, the uh, uh, the blood supply uh, to the uh, lungs happen in two forms, the vein and the artery. The veins supply uh, take the oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart on left side of the heart and the arteries which come from the right side of the heart and supply the uh, lung are basically containing deoxygenated blood. This is just an exception uh, from rest of the body where in rest of the body, the arteries contain oxygenated blood, whereas the vein take the uh, deoxygenated blood. However, in the lungs, it's just the opposite. And we must keep that in mind that in veins, it is oxygenated blood because the oxygenated blood is going back to the heart. And in the arteries, it is deoxygenated blood because the blood accumulated from rest of the uh, body into the heart is pushed back into the uh, uh, into the uh, lungs through the pulmonary arteries so we have two pulmonary arteries the right and the left pulmonary arteries and this figure shows the division of the pulmonary artery and we have four uh, pulmonary veins the right uh, superior vein and the right inferior vein uh, and the left superior vein and the left inferior vein moving on to the airway or the windpipe so the airway uh, our airway starts just below the larynx in the neck. So it starts in the neck and it is known as the trachea or the windpipe. Now uh, the trachea is then divides into the right and the left bronchus, which goes into the right heart uh, lung and the left lung. Now there is further division of this uh, uh, bronchus. So I'm concentrating, let's say on the right side. So this is known as the bronchial, uh, the bronchus uh, to the lobe. And these are known as lobar bronchus. So there will be an upper lobe bronchus, as I told you, there, there is a right upper lobe, right middle lobe, and a right lower lobe. There will be a right upper lobe bronchus, there will be a right middle lobe bronchus, and there will be a lower lobe bronchus. Similarly, on the left side, there is a right uh, left upper lobe bronchus and the left lower lobe bronchus. So these are known as uh, the uh, secondary bronchus. And once we move on uh, to segmental bronchial distribution, which are known as tertiary bronchials. So this is how uh, the uh, division of the airway uh, takes place. Moving on to the pleura. Now we have been very uh, commonly talking uh, talking about pleura. Uh, Sir also showed you uh, uh, some uh, commonly encountered diseases like pneumothorax and empyema, which we encountered in pleura. Now what is pleura? In order to understand uh, the pleura, it is a layer or a lining that covers the entire lung on both the sides. Now, in order to understand, it's not a, a single uh, time to figure, it's a double layer structure. Now, you imagine a balloon, which is very lightly filled with the uh, air, and you put your fist into the balloon. Now, here, imagine your fist as the lung, and uh, the, the balloon then becomes the pleura. So, there is a layer which is covering your hand, or in other words, the layer which covers the lung, which is known as the visceral pleura. And there is a layer which lines the inner side of the chest wall, which is known as the parietal pleura. In between these two uh, uh, layers of pleura, there is a potential space which is known as the pleural space. Now, normally, space contains a very minimal amount of fluid, which is 8 to 10 ml of fluid. And this fluid helps us in lubrication of the lung when it moves, and it also helps in keeping the lung expanded. So, if, as you can see here, what is the function of the pleura? Well, it allows for optimal expansion and contraction of the lung during breathing. The pleural fluid acts as a lubricant. So, it leads to smooth gliding of the lung and this fluid uh, is produced by the pleural layer itself. Now, when there is a problem with the production of the fluid, for whatever reason, if there is an excessive production of fluid by the pleura, then what will happen? You, you see that uh, the pleural cavity is a closed cavity and what happens is if the fluid increases, it will compress the lung and this condition is known as pleural effusion. Similarly, if air goes inside the pleural cavity from anywhere. It can go outside through trauma from outside or the lung may rupture and it can lead to air leaking from the lung. And as you can see with each breathing, the air will more and more air will accumulate inside the lung. And this will cause the collapse of the lung, which is known as pneumothorax or air in the cavity. Now, if this pleural fluid get, becomes infected 
because of any reason, it could be tuberculosis or other bacterial infection, then it, it leads to accumulation of pus inside the pleural cavity, which is known as pyothorax or what we commonly call empyema. Uh, the other organ uh, of importance in the uh, thorax is the food pipe. Now, food pipe starts again in the neck, in the region of the pharynx. It travels posterior in the posterior mediastinum and is a long tubular muscular structure which ends uh, after passing through the diaphragm into the stomach. It uh, acts as a conduit uh, for uh, the food that we take and it uh, leads to uh, uh, the stomach so that the food goes into the stomach uh, uh, efficiently without any problem. The last and uh, important organ uh, that we need to know about is the diaphragm. Now the diaphragm is a big muscle which is uh, arising from the lower part of the ribs the vertebral body, the lower part of the sternum, and then it uh, forms a central tendon in between. Now, basically what it does is, as you can see in this uh, image, uh, that the, when it contracts, it leads to flattening out. And along with the contraction of the intercostal muscles, what happens is the volume of the chest increases and it le leads to suction of air inside the chest and helps us in breathing. So there is an active contraction of the diaphragm, which leads to flattening out of the diaphragm, which leads to expansion of the chest volume and air going inside. When there is a passive release of that contraction, the air is exhaled out. So this is a very important muscle uh, in our body and uh, various kind of, it can be affected by various kinds of diseases. The more two more common diseases that we see in our practice is what is known as a diaphragmatic infiltration. If you look at this x-ray uh, here on the uh, right side, this is the level of the diaphragm, whereas on the left side, the diaphragm is pushed up. So the lung is very uh, small on this side compared to the right side. This process is known as diaphragmatic uh, uh, eventration. And this requires surgery where we, uh, we plicate this uh, uh, excessive bulging of the diaphragm and make it flat again. So this is known as diaphragmatic plication. Another important uh, area in this is diaphragmatic hernia. You can see there, there was no defect. If you can see, there is no defect here. It's just an outpouching or a weakness of the diaphragm. On the other hand, here, there is a defect in the diaphragm, which pushes the abdominal content into the chest. This is known as a diaphragmatic hernia. And this also requires a reduction of all this content back into the abdomen and then repair of this uh, defect, either by a mesh repair or a direct repair. So this is known as diaphragmatic hernia repair. Now, to summarize my presentation, uh, we need to understand that the basic understanding of anatomy and physiology is very important if you really want to uh, take care of a thoracic surgical patient. In today's program, it's just a curtain raiser. There is a huge uh, amount of knowledge available in anatomy and physiology. I've, I've tried to make it very simple in order to understand uh, for you to understand it very clearly. Uh, now, those who are interested in thoracic nursing should use this opportunity to motivate yourself and seek knowledge and develop the skills that are required to become uh, ultimately become a thoracic nurse, which will go a long way in providing best of the care to your patients. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to take any questions. And I bring, uh, thank you all uh, uh, for a patient listening. Uh, thank you, Bilal. Uh, I have been uh, looking at the Q&A chat. So there are uh, a lot of questions related to my talk, which we'll uh, cover uh, later. Now, one question that uh, is related to your talk, Bilal, is uh, someone is asking, what is dependent lung? For instance, our consultants auscultate on a patient's chest and ask to give a patient a right or left lateral position. So in terms of less air entry, when and which lung side needs to be kept upper or down? They... Uh, Pooja Negi wants a clarification of this. Bilal? Okay. So, uh, basically, uh, uh, if, if you remember the uh, diagram that I showed you, the lung is there in from the top to the bottom part of the eye. So, when we talk about dependent portion of the lung, the dependent portion of the lung is the portion of the lung which is towards the floor or towards the gravity. So, if we look, if we are, it, it, the dependent portion of the lung will depend on the patient's position. So, if I am sitting, the dependent portion of the lungs are my basal areas uh, of the lung. However, if the patient is lying down on one side, so for example, you know, on the left side, if the patient is lying on the left side, the left lung becomes the dependent lung and the right lung uh, becomes the non-dependent lung. So the breathing pattern is, it is said that in the if it is a non-dependent lung, uh, the breathing pattern, the air movement to the non uh, to the dependent lung is rather difficult. And that is why 
when we talk about physiotherapy in patients, we need to change posture of the patient so that the patient's posture can be uh, periodically changed uh, into the right lateral or the left lateral and making right lung as well as the left lung uh, in a non-dependent position and giving physiotherapy in that position. So I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, it answers the question. And uh, there are a couple of other questions, but I think uh, I'm, uh, we are very particular about time. So we'll uh, move on now. So Bilal, you may go ahead with introducing the other member of our family, Dr. Hush. Yes, sir. So uh, it is my genuine pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague, Dr. Harsh Vardhan Puri. He is a consultant uh, with us at the Institute of Chest Surgery, Chest Ronco Surgery at Medanta, uh, the Medicity Gurgaon. Uh, he has been an associate consultant uh, with us at Center for Chest Surgery, Sir Gangaram Hospital. He's the first board certified thoracic surgeon in the country. And, and I'm very proud to say that he's also a gold medal uh, medalist uh, as uh, uh, during his DNB super specialty program. An MBBS from uh, Jammu University, he did his post-graduation in general surgery from Sir Gangaram Hospital and was the recipient of the MK Mehra Award for postgraduate uh, in uh, Gangaram Hospital in 2012. Apart from performing the entire range of thoracic surgery, he has special interest in video-assisted thoracic surgery and is also uh, into the process of starting the interventional pulmonology, pulmonary program, uh, pulmonology program um, at our department here at Medanta. He is an avid researcher, has published over 30 articles in reputed journals, and has lectured frequently on COVID-related topics in public webinars as well as to doctors, and has been a frequent and has had a frequent appearance on television channels as well. He also devotes his time to the social causes, which is one of a very, very important part. The sir has already pointed out, Lung Care Foundation. He's a very, very active member. It is my genuine pleasure to now welcome Dr. Harsh Vardhan Puri. Over to you, Harsh. Uh, just Harsh, before you start speaking, uh, I would wish to share with everyone that Dr. Harsh actually holds a very, very special position in my heart and Bilal's heart, because when we started the program, DNB, he was the first person joining that program. And you would know the first person doing anything you would always remember. So he joined us as a student and bright person that he is. He became our colleague. And today, he is an esteemed member of the family. Friends, all of us depart in the department, we are colleagues, but we don't work just like colleagues. We are all part of a thoracic surgery family and passion is what binds all of us together. Harsh, over to you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thanks for that generous introduction and sir, uh, thanks for your blessings uh, for us here. I think today is the start of a revolution as you started in 2012 from shifting from uh, AIMS to Gangaram to start a program in thoracic surgery. So today, I think there, there would be a historic day in the nursing when there is a program being started for nurses. I What I feel is we doctors only treat and nurses care. And in treatment of a patient or a management of a patient, care is much more important than only giving treatment. So I'll be starting with sharing my slides. Well said. Very well said. Thanks. So my slides are visible? Yes. So the topic of discussion will be preoperative assessment of a thoracic surgery patient. So whenever a patient comes with some complaints related to thoracic surgery or the chest, then how do we assess that patient, evaluate that patient, and see what, what we are going to do with, with that patient? So the flow of presentation will be why to assess, assess that patient and how to assess. So how history, examination, radiology, biopsy, pulmonary assessment, we'll be doing it in a very simple language so that everybody can understand what we are going to tell you. So why to access? assess? The patient comes to your OPD. Most of these patients don't know their diagnosis, what they are suffering from. They have some symptoms. Those, so they, they tell you their symptoms and then you have to reach to a diagnosis to start the treatment. The other thing is to evaluate whether the patient is a surgical candidate or he, he uh, will benefit from uh, conservative management. If he's a surgical candidate, is he fit enough to undergo a surgery because thoracic surgery is a very major surgery and to risk assess the risk-benefit ratio. We have to see whether the risks of doing a surgery are much more than the benefits or the benefits overweigh the risks. 
and then we decide which surgery, how to do it and all the stuff. So how to assess? The first point I want to tell you, every clinician should remember is a good history taking. It starts from the present complaint from which for which the patient has come to us, the history of that complaint, any such history in the past, any relevant drug history, any family history related to that uh, disease, any social history of the uh, that patient and review of other symptoms. If you take this history in the manner which I've told you, 30% of the patient's diagnosis will, differentials will be made only based on history taking. Now, it should always be followed. It should be very empathic. You should ask them empathically what they are going through, what is their whole scenario, and then we can proceed from that there. The other very important part which, we, which people are neglecting these days is clinical examination. If you don't touch your patient, your patient will never develop that trust on you. Trust is very important in the management of a patient. So it's my humble request to every doctor, every nurse, every nursing student to just go and touch the patient in a protocol manner so that he or she develops a good trust on you. So the parts of clinical examination are inspection, where you see the patient and make a narrative, then palpation, where you touch the patient and uh, confirm the findings of inspection, then you percuss, and then very important that you auscultate. Auscultation in a pre-operative as well as a post-operative patients gives you a brief idea or a very uh, brief thing what, what he is going through. He may be having less air entry on one side. He may be having fluid on uh, in the chest. So the breath sounds differ in these conditions. So auscultation is very important. And then the examination of the other symptoms. If you do these two things very meticulously, 50% of the diagnosis will be made in your OPD only. Now we have many things which will assist us in making the diagnosis, which are very important in the modern era. The other very important thing is radiology. Most common investigation which we order sitting in our OPD, and it's very readily available, very cheap, give us a fair idea of what we are going through, is a chest X-ray. There are many views in chest X-ray. I won't be going into details, but brief, briefly, I'll be telling you about that. One is PA view, other is AP view, and third is third one is lateral view. So PA view is the most commonly used. I'll tell you why this is the most commonly uh, used view. It is in AP view, which is anterior posterior view. It is mostly used in the patients who are body bent, who are bedridden, or in the post-operative settings when the patient hasn't uh, mobilized. And we use this view in the post-operative setting. And the lateral view we use when we want to see the mediastinum or we want to see a small loculated pneumothorax. Why PA view is uh, most common? Now, you see this, this diagram in uh, above. The source of the X-ray is here, and the patient lies with the front towards the source of the X-ray. So the most prominent organ which we can see in this diagram is the heart. So what happens in PA view, uh, PA view is that this is the PA view. The source is here, and the back lies towards the uh, uh, source of the rays. So Lungs are the first organs which uh, the rays will, will hit. Now you can see the difference between the, the two X-rays. This is a PA view. This is a AP view. PA view is much more clearer. The lung fields are much more prominent. The heart is actually the, uh, the, the site of heart is the normally looking site. In the AP view, the heart is always shown bigger than the normal what it is. And the scapulas don't cover the most of the lung in PA view, but scapulas cover most of the lung in AP view. So three major things. It is PA view is better looking view. It, the scapulas don't cover the lung fields and the heart is shown to uh, what extent it is. It is not showing uh, shown as a bigger organ uh, than the PA view. So that's why the PA view is the most important view of, uh, of ordering a chest X-ray. Now, how to read a chest X-ray? Very basic we'll do. The detailing of the chest X-ray, there may be a name on the chest X-ray, type of film, whether it is a PA view or an AP view. Right is when, if there is any rotation, if there is any inspiration, pick, uh, the quality of the picture, the exposure, the soft tissue like the breast and all those stuff. And the most important, airway, breathing, circulation, diaphragms and extra. Airway, you can see, this is the airway, these are the major airway in the form of trachea and the bronchi. You can well very well appreciate uh, trachea should always be a central organ. 
if it is a deviated it denotes some pathology breathing the lungs lung field have to be seen very clearly uh, symmetry of the lung fields any pleural shadow any effusion and you what what most importantly you have to rule out pneumothorax here circulation the heart the uh, hilar shadows and diaphragm you can see the diaphragm level of diaphragm right is slightly uh, above the left one because of the presence of liver here so a b c d of reading the x rays and then the extras you have may have lines in the chest you have may have nasogastric tube you can very well appreciate on a chest x ray so this is how a very basic chest x ray can be read now comes uh, modern investigations which uh, surely help us in diagnosing the patient finding the anatomical part which is involved like the upper part of the lung as dr bilal has told the middle part of the lung the lower part of the lung part of the media sternum or something the most important investigation nowadays is a computed tomography which is known as a ct there are different kinds of ct one is a hr ct very commonly you have heard in covid times uh, the use of hr ct then there is non contrast ct in the patients who have renal dysfunction then the most important is the most commonly uh, we order a contrast enhanced ct to know whether which is the anatomical location of the pathology and what is the relation with the other organs the ld ct which is known as low dose ct is now being very commonly used in uh, thoracic surgery as a screening program for finding very early lung cancer which is important for the management of those patients positron emission tomography you must have heard pet scan it's very important investigation in cases of cancer because it 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 uh, uh, works on the principle that uh, the it uh, takes the compound known as 18 fluorodeoxy glucose which is kind of a glucose and it works on the principle that the tumor cells which are very rapidly uh, dividing cells use this kind of glucose more than the other cells and you can very well appreciate in the picture that the uh, tumor areas are illuminated as 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 a yellow yellow thing and rest of the areas which are normal are not illuminated this Uh, investigation helps in staging of the uh, cancer and guides the clinician to target the biopsy areas i want to make very clear that pet scan is not the diagnostic of any cancer or a pathology the diagnosis is always made on a biopsy but this pet scan helps us to guide where this biopsy has to be taken from like like the liver or the lungs or the mediastinum or where and it is the most important investigation to stage the tumor now coming to biopsy no treatment in any of the patient can be started if we don't have a histopathological diagnosis of that pathology so that's why we need a biopsy of that patient this can be done in by various methods the most modern methods of doing these biopsies are not blind they are under image guidance like ct guidance ultrasound guidance or bronchoscopy guidance now what is bronchoscopy bronchoscopy is when you put in a visualizing scope into the respiratory tract of a patient and want to see that the uh, trachea that bronchi and other uh, air spaces inside from inside the uh, thoracic cavity it's very important for making a diagnosis by doing a biopsy taking a bronchial alveolar lavage where you can do a microbiological test upon endobronchial ultrasound to do biopsies of the lymph nodes and all those stuff or to take biopsies of the tumors in the in the airway system and to assess assess the airway before surgery which is very important for a thoracic surgeon and advanced procedures also we can do uh, like dilatations in case of tracheal stenosis and stent placements in case of stenosis and fistulas coming to esophagoscopy or upper gi endoscopy a relevant investigation because esophagus is a very important organ of uh, thorax it needs it has many pathologies like esophageal strictures and cancers of esophagus so for the diagnosis of these cases like esophageal cancer and tracheal esophageal fistula esophagus scopy is very important and for advanced uh, uh, procedures like stent placement in tracheoesophageal fistula this is also a scope which goes into the food pipe of the patient and can assess the uh, upper food pipe the middle food pipe the lower food pipe and even the uh, stomach and duodenum of that patient very important in uh, esophageal pathologies now coming to pulmonary function test very commonly ordered by a thoracic surgeon or a chest uh, surgeon why we want to do the most common uh, procedures which we do on a patient are lung resections 
so when you want to lung resection means taking away a part of the lung or taking out a part of the lung now when we are taking out a part of the lung we want to know well in advance whether the patient lung capacity is good enough that if we even take a part of lung out of his body then also he can breathe easily he, his uh, pulmonary functions don't suffer too much so for that thing a pulmonary function test is always ordered before doing these surgeries done to show how well a lung is working it uh, divides the patient into restrictive of or obstructive diseases methods of doing are spirometry and lithography i won't be going into the details it's very important as i have told because we are performing going to perform the lung resection on that patient so we well in advance want to know whether that patient lung capacity is good enough to perform this surgery or not and all these things which we are doing if they are not up to the mark uh, my next speakers will tell you how we make these patients fit enough to undergo these major surgeries by making them do lot of physiotherapy lot of nutritional assess, uh, uh, optimization and all those stuff this is a pft machine where in the patient has to blow in this machine and this machine gives you a graph which would look look like something like this and it gives us lot of information in in uh, form of lung volumes force expiratory capacity force ventilatory capacity in one seconds which are very important and we assess the patient based on some permutation combination and calculations whether we want to do the surgery up front or just we want to prepare the patient and then do the surgery cardiac evaluation is very important because occult cardiac diseases are very common these days so every patient who is above the age of 40 years or who is a high risk candidate for cardiac uh, diseases is evaluated by a ecg which is an electrocardiogram 2d echocardiogram stress echocardiogram and angiography in some cases where we even find that his heart uh, uh, vessels are blocked and sometimes we have also done combination surgeries by doing uh, cabgs and lung surgeries in the same setting this uh, we are the only department who are experts in doing these kind of surgeries also baseline anesthesia in investigations and pre anesthesia clearance is very important because it is the anesthetist who has to make the patient uh, uh, fit enough for undergoing these major surgeries so they evaluate the patient based on some baseline investigation the mouth opening the tracheal uh, diameter they see the cts which kind of tubes will uh, be put to intubate the patient and all those stuff so their clearance is very important so they order for a complete blood count renal function test liver function test inr spt this these tests uh, tell us about lot of abnormalities which which are there in these tests and we try to correct these abnormalities uh, for preparing the patient uh, for the surgery see the uh, more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war is the dictum which should be followed in surgery the more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war so prepare the patient properly and then you can have a sound sleep when your patient will go for the surgery and any other department specific uh, clearances if we have to take neuro clearances other clearances we take them and prepare the patient make him fit for the surgery so and at the end of this assessment exercise we know the exact diagnosis know whether the patient is a surgical candidate or a medical candidate whether he is fit to undergo this surgery or not and whether how to make that patient fit for that surgery and then proceed for that surgery so thank you from the institute of chest surgery uh, um, greetings from institute today is the start of an era i am saying today is the start of an era thanks a lot now i'm ready to take any questions if you have dr harsh i am looking at the q and a i think uh, you made things so clear i don't see any question popping up right now so i'll hand over to neha so we are continuously keeping a, a watch on the q and a tab as and when there is a question we'll come back to you harsh thank over you to neha. yeah thank you dr harsh for this wonderful talk uh, now we'll take a quick coffee break and we'll be back by sharp at 11 please don't log out if in case you log out you won't be able to join it back so we'll meet at 11 so this zoom platform allows 1000 people we already have 1000 people logged in so if anyone logs out then you'll have to go on youtube live feed which is there so we have hundreds of people who are on the youtube live feed 
So in case you happen to log out and you are not able to log back again, you could just click on the other link in your email, which is for you. Same thing, same thing is going on YouTube Live also. The only difference is there is no Q&A chat, but there is a comment box and whatever comments you are writing there, they are being posted in the Q&A chat here and we are getting those comments and we will be answering those also. So please have a coffee break. 11 o'clock sharp, we will restart the next presentation.
Uh, Nehan, let's start. Sure, sir. Uh, now, begin with the program. I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Sukram Bishnoi. Dr. Sukram Bishnoi is currently an Associate of Consulting, Institute of Chest Surgery, Chest Onco Surgery, and Lung Transplantation. Medanta the Medicity Guru Gram. He is former Associative Consultant, Center for Chest Surgery at Sargangaram Hospital. Dr. Sukram is a board certified thoracic surgeon trained within our system and is now a vital part of the team and contributing to its growth. He is an MBBS from Kilpok Medical College, Chennai, and post graduation in surgery from Sargangaram Hospital. He has special interest in training lung cancer, in treating lung cancer, anterior mediastinal mass, including thymoma, esophageal cancer, and benign lung disease like aspergilloma, bronchiectasis, empyma, pneumothorax, and chest wall tumors. Dr. Sukram is trained in minimally invasive surgeries like VATS lobectomy, VATS decortication, blibectomy, minimally invasive lung surgeries, as well as interior mediastinal and diaphragmatic surgery. It's my proud privilege to invite Dr. Sukram. Over to you, sir. Um, Dr. Sukram, before you start speaking, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure for me to say a few words. So we have a prio in our department, which consists of Dr. Harsh, uh, Dr. Sukram, and Dr. Mohan. So apart from the fact that they're all passionate about thoracic surgery, what joins three of them is that all three of them are DNBs from within our system. So they are people who train within the system and are now training others within the system. So best wishes to you. Over to you, Sukram. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's my humble uh, duty to uh, thanks all delegates who has uh, taken out of uh, their busy schedule and joined on the virtual uh, platform. So my uh, presentation will be on uh, my, my slides are visible. Yes, go full screen. Yeah, you are full screen. Okay, so my topic is pre-operative preparation. Uh, why pre-operative uh, preparation? Thing is that if we want a happy destination, then we should anticipate all the uh, eventualities in the pathway. So in medical field, what is the happy ending? Happy ending is the happy and healthy patient, satisfied patient going home. So in order to achieve that, we should anticipate all the difficulties and prepare for that. And it enhances the patient's safety to reduce the error and reduce perioperative morbidity and mortality. Important thing is that to relieve anxiety and fear of the patient. And in order to achieve that, the reduction of the cost shortening of the ICU stay and shortening of the hospital stay. So in the end, if we want a happy and satisfied patient, we have to prepare for that. And how we can prepare is that the next thing is that the method, which I would like to divide into the five things. These five things are one is the disease optimization in preoperative period, the medication optimization, nutrition of the patient and preoperative counseling. In out of uh, and physiotherapy out of five i will be speaking for the first four and fifth will be taken care by the dr deepika so the first thing is the disease optimization i would like to classify these diseases into the respiratory diseases heart diseases kidney liver central nervous system disease thyroid diabetes mellitus obesity and other diseases so why optimization if 
we are able to identify the problem prior to the happening it it's very important to control in the pre operative periods if the time, more time is spent in the control of the disease in the prior pre operative area then the better is the post operative outcome which will lead us to the reduce the morbidity and hospital stay so if the we are uh, uh, sweat more in the piece less we will bleed in the war so if there is a hurry at this stage will be having the worry in the post operative period so friends the pre operative optimization is very important if we don't hurry at this stage we will not worry at the, this uh, the post operative period so if hurry lead to the post operative worry uh, the first disease which i would like to take is the respiratory disease it is uh, why it is important is because of the pollution covid and tuberculosis the in, uh, respiratory disease incidence are rise on the uh, uh, in current uh, scenario in india even younger population is getting more and more respiratory diseases friends when we get a patient of the respiratory disease mostly the uh, co common comorbidity associated with the copd or asthma these patients may be on the continue inhaler or other medications these medication in pre operative uh, a, uh, time it should be continued even on the day of, uh, of operation these inhalers and medication to be continued uh, another point which i would like to emphasize is smoking if the duration of smoking cessation is uh, more the more the benefit will be the patient but whatever the duration it should be stopped prior to the patient taking up for the surgery if all these diseases or problems are there we should consult in pre operative period a pulmonologist or a physician if it is required patient to be optimized the second problem is heart disease which include the heart hypertension patient coming to the pre operative area or pre operative preparation may have the recent mi may have the cardiac failure there may be arrhythmias and blood pressure control is very important in the pre operative pe period so the detailed cardiac workup in our unit what we would like we used to do is any patient who is as more than 30 years we would like to call up our cardiologist who do the workup as per the merit of the patient may be sometimes require this uh, plain ecg may be eco or dobutamin stress eco the another disease which is on the rise is the renal disease the incidence of renal disease are on the uh, rise and important in these uh, why renal disease are important because the some of the patient who in thoracic surgery having the tubercular empyema or clotted hemothorax may have associated with the renal disease these patients come up with the altered acid base uh, status may have the altered electrolyte or altered platelet functions or low hemoglobin which may have the lot of problem intraoperative or post operative periods so pre operative optimization of these patients is important nephrologist to be involved for the better outcome the next problem is the liver these patients may have the chronic liver disease may be hbs ag positive or scv positive and it impact the lot of in, uh, poor outcome so gastroenterologist to be consulted if required in these patients the next disease is central nervous system the lot of patient who are coming with the trauma or may have the seizure epilepsy or parkinson disease or other uh, diseases of uh, central nervous system the patient who are on drug which are on for epilepsy or for parkinsonism should be continued till the pre operative period or maybe intra operative or post operative duration the lot of these drugs patient who are on these drugs may have the psychotropic effect and these drugs may interact with the uh, uh, intra operative or post operative or anesthetic drug so the drug optimization to be done what are, what are the drug to be continued in the post operative or intra operative period so for that neurologist to be consulted if required the another disease which is commonly very commonly occurring is thyroid a patient may have the hypo or hyperthyroid drugs these uh, patient, uh, drugs to be continued in the intra operative or post operative periods the thyroid profile to be done if required endocrinologist or physician to be consulted the another disease which is the diabetes mellitus india is the capital of diabetes mellitus incidence are chronically on the rise and what are the problem can diabetes can cause is like impaired wound healing it can cause a ketoacidosis uncontrolled sugar and there are increased incidence of the intra operative or post operative event of the C, uh, uh, coronary heart disease and it can cause the, lead to the comorbidities like the ckd cva uh, so, so many things so sugar control is essential consult the endocrinologist or physician in pre operative periods for better uh, uh, post operative outcome 
the most of the disease i covered in the uh, disease uh, uh, segment comorbidity segment the few medications which are left the few diseases which are may not be covered in these things and uh, miscellaneous disease which should be optimized prior to the patient taking for the surgery the most important in these drugs are the antiplatelet all antiplatelet should be stopped 5 days prior to the surgery some of may patient are on ecosprin which may have, uh, get operated even on ecosprin or maybe stopping 48 to 24 to 48 hours the other anticoagulant should be uh, converted to heparin 5 day, uh, days prior to the surgery and the another important point few of my friends may be in the ot so they would like to i would like to emphasize them the dvt pump should be started prior to the induction and the another point where the uh, the patient who are more prone for the dvt like deep in thrombosis maybe the uh, uh, old age long surgery or cancer patients they should be preoperatively be given heparin if there is no contraindication the antibiotic prophylaxis my friends who are working in the uh, the ot uh, pre operative pro antibiotic prophylaxis should be given prior to the starting of the induction of the another point uh, the third point which i was uh, look to emphasize is nutrition malnutrition patient should be prepared in the pre operative period it gives us to the poor healing poor healing and lead to the more hospital stay more icu stay poor outcome and these poor outcomes will lead to the unsatisfied patient so these patients should be prepared pre operatively and these patients should be put on the high protein diet maybe the 80 to 100 gram of the protein per day high calorie diet 2000 to 2500 if there is no contraindication and if patient is able to take the oral we should put patient on the oral diet with the high protein and high calorie diet if patient is not able to take the intake uh, adequate intake we may put patient on the rice tube feeding or maybe the with the combination of the rice tube feeding or oral diet both can suffice our uh, calorie intake so better aggressive feeding in pre operative period is essential for the post operative outcome and these patients may be the aggressive uh, feeding make uh, in peri operative period like in the post op or immediate post op or late post op it gives the better healing and low, uh, better outcome the fourth point is pre operative counseling pre operative counseling consist of the what i mean the whole road map or pathway patient uh, coming to the hospital and getting discharged from the hospital it's like explaining the disease what are the treatment option to the patient whether patient should go for the surgery or maybe for the medical treatment prognosis of the disease if patient has opted for the surgery then surgical drill drill start from the pre operative period pre operative night how patient should sleep what bath and all those should be taken the next day whole drill the when to get up when to take the bath and when patient will be taken up for the surgery friends we have unique system which is intra operative period information given to the relative it's like the live description uh, our clinical coordinators when patient is taken up for the surgery the we uh, we give every 2 to 3 hourly the information to the relative it's very important because when in the patient in the uh, uh, theater the all the relatives are worried about all those things so if we give over information or well communicated patient is always a happy patient and happy patient means the better outcome uh with this i would like to thank you uh, thanks from the institute of chest surgery the my next uh, 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 colleague will be dr deepika before that i would like to have the uh, question and answer on on the my topic uh, dr sukram i am uh, looking at the q and a is uh, the questions uh, there is a uh, one question how does renal disease affect the body well uh, renal disease affects the body in many ways it makes you retain urea creatinine all the toxins remain inside and therefore it creates problems it has lot of other uh, effects on all systems in the body and it's a very messy situation uh, dr sukram i don't see any question right now so what we'll do you go ahead with the introducing dr deepika and as and when the question comes i'll post it to you okay sir uh, so uh, dr deepika is a uh, presently respiratory therapist in our department department of institute of chest surgery uh, for last 4 uh, uh, years she has done her post graduation from the sada university and uh, uh, has experience of 5 years in the field of uh, chest physiotherapy all to you dr deepika ah uh, 
Well, before uh, Dr. Deepika takes over, I wish to state that physiotherapist forms a very, very, very important component mm -hmm. of any chest unit. And we are blessed mm -hmm. to have Deepika with us. And I have no hesitation saying that her presence and her active involvement makes a lot of difference to the care of the patients. And it's a very, very integral, important part of the overall care of the patient. If you do a good surgery, they have problems post-op because of poor physiotherapy being done in post-op, your outcome will not be good. So presence of a good physiotherapist makes a difference in the outcome of these patients. Deepika, over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words and Dr. Sukram. Uh, let's start with my presentation. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, is my slide? Yeah, it's visible. It's visible. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. So, let's start with my presentation. It's a pre-operative preparation of thoracic surgery patients. So, in this uh, time in this uh, 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 in my presentation we will uh, see how the how we prepare the patient before going to the thoracic surgery uh, in our patients so the objective of presentation is why physiotherapy is important in thoracic surgery and second question what we will uh, see in this presentation is how will you do a pre operative assessment so the role of chest physiotherapy it mobilizes pulmonary secretions. It promotes the expansion of lungs and prevents the lungs from collapse. Strengthens breathing muscles, helps to loosen and improve drainage of thick lung secretions. So what is the goal of chest physiotherapy? To improve the information to help enhance physical fitness and increase physical activity. Before going to the surgery, we can check the patient's physical fitness and their physical activity. Is the patient is fit for the surgery or not? And by doing this chest physiotherapy or for the uh, respiratory rehab for the patient to improve the patient's quality, quality of life and to reduce the length of stay in hospital, to optimize nutritional status and improve mental health status. As Dr. Sukram said, that nutrition is also a very important part of the chest surgery. So what will we see in the patient assessment? We see pulmonary function test, six-minute walk test, and a stair climbing test. So for pulmonary function test, we assess, we, this assessment is the important part before going, before, is important part of the patient before going to the thoracic surgery. Because this, part, uh, this PFT, pulmonary function test, shows the lung capacities of the patient. In six-minute walk test, we just, this assessment is used to determine the patient's exercise tolerance. It may be useful for measuring the functional ability and fitness with certain health conditions. In stair climbing test, it is commonly cited that the ability to climb five flights of stairs without stopping and without significant drop of their saturation. If the patient resting saturation is 98% and after uh, uh, climb the five flights of stairs, the patient's saturation drops to 94 or 95%, then it's not the worrisome. But if the patient's saturation is 98% and after climb the five flights of stairs, if the patient's saturation drops to 90% or 89%, so this means the patient is in low risk for the surgery. So we just prepare the patient before going to the thoracic surgery. I will come to that slide after. So now the green signal means the patient is fit for surgery and we can take the patient for the surgery immediately. The yellow signal shows the patient is in moderate risk. This means we can prepare the patient for some days and weeks and then we can take up the patient for the surgery. The red signal means the patient is in high risk. So we can prepare the patient uh, for about weeks or months, and we again reassess the patient before taking up for the surgery, and then we can take the patient for the surgery. 
so how can we prepare the patient for the surgery so this is our this this physiotherapy center is the part of our thoracic surgery unit for is the part of our institute of the chest surgery in medanta hospital we just take the patient uh pre operative preparation before going to the surgery so we tell the patient to do deep breathing exercises we take up the patient for some cardio exercises like treadmill static cycle cross trainer and we can take we can make the patient run like a hell we can uh, build up the patient muscles we do the muscle strengthening exercises and these are the and assisted coughing exercises exercises which will help the patient after the surgery which will help the patients post operative complications so the the more the patient will exercise in their pre operative uh, preparation the less the complications will be faced by the patient in their post operative complications so today conclu conclusion for my slides are physiotherapy is an essential and integral component of patients who are undergoing thoracic surgery Ass assessment of the patient for the fitness is mandatory in all the patients who are undergoing thoracic surgery if the patient seems having low pulmonary function then the patient should be prepared very well before undergoing any chest surgery which will definitely help in the better recovery for chest surgery so before finishing my slides my presentation i will like to say chest physiotherapy is very close to my heart it has very important part in care of thoracic surgery patients helping patients mobilize and breathe effectively goes a long way in improving outcomes and it is my passion so exercise is a very important part pre and post operative care for the patient thoracic surgery patient thank you everyone now i will hand over my uh, presentation and now i will introduce a But again my family dr deepika i'm looking at the q and a uh, chat there are a couple of uh, uh, questions which i have answered online to them so uh, right now there is nothing for you to take uh, here so we can go ahead introducing the next okay so now i'm going to introduce a uh, 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 next family member of our unit Dr. Mohan Venkatesh Pule. So, Dr. Mohan Venkatesh Pule is presently associated consultant, Institute of Chest Surgery, Chest Onco Surgery, and Lung Transplantation in Medanta, the Mid City. He is former associated consultant, Chest Center for Chest Surgery, Sir Gangaram Hospital. Dr. Mohan is country's board certified thoracic surgeon with a gold medal. Trained within our system and is now a vital part of the team and contributing to its growth. An MBBS from Dr. N C R University of Health Sciences, University in Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh, and post graduation in surgery from Sir Gangaram Hospital. He was awarded President's Gold Medal. in general surgery and thoracic surgery from national board of examination he was also a recipient of torrens lung scholar award by association of surgeons of india in 2015 he also did his clinical observership in tata memorial hospital mumbai to gain valuable experience in the field of thoracic oncology dr mohan specialized in open as well as thoracic thoracoscopic web surgery for pneumothorax infective lung diseases huh? like emphysema aspergillus yes. and other tubercular diseases and whole special interest in tracheal reconstruction and lung preservation yes. surgery over to you dr mohan mohan before you speak uh, hamid can you mute yourself please hamid <laughs> hamid please mute yourself <laughs> Ahmed, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Mohan presents, I'd like to say a few uh, words about him. My first uh, interaction with him was when I was uh, 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 part of the academic team of Association of Surgeons of India. We used to conduct uh, national resident training programs, and Dr. Mohan was there at the national level. Uh, he won. 
uh, one of the best resident awards for his presentation. And uh, so that was my first interaction with him. And then he decided to join the department, which was a very welcome moment. And he forms actually, I said Trinity, but it's not Trinity because uh, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Sukram, Dr. Mohan, apart from these three, now we have two more members, Dr. Vivek and Dr. Sumit, who are also our students who joined us as consultants. So there are actually five Pandavas here who are part of this, uh, our own system. The main point about Dr. Mohan is that he also has a flair for writing. And ladies and gentlemen, when I shared that in the last two years of COVID period, our center had over 50 publications, papers printed in various index journals nationally and internationally, Dr. Mohan had a huge role to play in that. Mohan, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, and uh, Dr. Deepika. Uh, really appreciate for that kind introduction. It's really an exciting moment for me uh, to speak in front of such enthusiastic nursing personnel from across the country. Today, I am supposed to speak on the post-operative management of a thoracic surgical patient. Everybody has a notion that a good surgery is enough uh, for a patient for the complete recovery. But unfortunately, in thoracic surgery, the truth is something very, very different. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, I will try my level best to take you through the exciting journey of a post-operative care of a thoracic, thoracic surgical patient. So please fasten your seat belts, sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. So in the post-operative care, there are three things I want to uh, very uh, importantly impress you. That is three things. The first one is why the post-operative care is important in a thoracic surgical patient and how it is different from the post-operative care of other surgeries and what are the essential components of a post-operative care in a thoracic surgical patient. First of all, let's go with the why it is important. I will go with the real case scenarios that we see in day-to-day -day practice. This is one of our many patients where the patient had a tumor in the, his right middle lobe of the lung, where we performed uh, lobectomy, it's called right upper bilobectomy, where the upper and middle lobes were removed. And you can see the very good chest X-ray, the patient got discharged on the third post-operative day. And now comes another scenario where the patient is the another patient is having a similar kind of tumor and we did the same surgery for the patient however in this case the patient had post operative pneumonia on the post operative day 3 and the patient had to be shifted to icu he had to be kept on ventilator he had to be tracheostomized and he had one month of hospital stay and later on he got discharged so what is the why there is a difference in the outcome the patient, both patients are of same age, same disease characteristics. The patient's characteristics are same. The surgery performed was same. However, the post-operative management is the different in these both patients. That's why there is the difference in the outcome. So how the chest surgery is different from other surgeries? For example, I have just quote, uh, shown two images here. There is a fracture or injury to the upper limb or lower limb. For in those situations, you can actually immobilize by casting those uh, fractures and the patient will have less pain and the patient will recover. Unfortunately, chest surgery is one of the most painful surgeries that you can experience in your body because the most important reason for that is you cannot immobilize your chest. You cannot stop breathing. So every time, we, every minute, the, the chest moves at least 18 to 20 times a minute. So this is one of the main reasons the chest surgery is one of the most painful surgeries. And unfortunately, the organ way on which we are operating and the complication in which the, the post-operative pain is causing 
are both the same. It is the lung. Naturally, after any kind of uh, chest surgery, there are some changes happens in the body which will lead to the pulmonary dysfunction. So the post-operative care of this patient should be aimed at all these points that I have mentioned to compensate the pulmonary dysfunction that happens after the surgery. So we have discussed why it is important and how it is different. Now we will be going to what are the components of the post-operative care in chest surgery. So as the previous speakers very elegantly said, the preoperative counseling and preparation is very, very important component. You have to counsel, you have to communicate, you have to talk to the both the patient as well as attendants. What is the course of the hospital stay that's going to be? What the outcomes that patient to be expecting? And what are our protocols of postoperative management so that they can comply with the, the orders that are going in the postoperative period for the betterment of the patient? Friends, the postoperative care is not same for all. The one size doesn't fit all because every patient has their own age, their own comorbidities, the type of the disease is different, the type of surgery is different, the, some patient may require post-operative ventilatory support, some patient, some patient may have intraoperative some problems, so one size doesn't fit all. The post-operative care should be tailored to each and every patient depending on his age, depending on his comorbidities, depending on his disease as well as patient characteristics. So the main three pillars of post-operative care, number one is the pain relief, number two, physiotherapy, and number three is the nutrition. These three are the pillars of our post-operative care based on which the, the actually the patient recovers in the post-operative period. To start with, I want to, uh, I want to just share the routine post-operative orders that when we operate a patient and shift the patient to ICU for a night, we write these post-operative orders to the sisters so that uh, they can uh, comply with what are the things that we are actually expecting to do. So the monitoring, apart from monitoring the routine uh, vitals like blood pressure, pulse rate, oxygen saturation, the drain output and the urine output, most of the thoracic surgical patients actually don't need NPO status more than six hours because we are not doing anything to their elementary tract. So we keep the patient for four to six hours so that the anesthesia effects will come down and then the patient can be started on the liquid diet and eventually soft diet and then normal diet. The, as far as the fluids are concerned, the less is the better because the patient, if the patient retains fluid and the patient has been given more of fluids, the, the patient will uh, accumulate the spoons in the lungs and the patient have uh, uh, different uh, outcomes after the surgery. The other special instructions that we give to, give to our patients is that the, all of our patients should be kept in proper position. This is how we love to see our patients in the ICU. So the patient head end should be 45 degree or 50 degree up so that the respiratory efforts are much, much better compared to supine position. As soon as the patient comes to the ICU, the, the patient should be nebulized with a dual and buticard so that the post-operative bronchospasm should be, can, be, uh, can be prevented. And we love to give the oxygen supplementation for throughout the night, irrespective of the saturation of the patient. So these are the post-operative orders as far as medications are concerned. We give antibiotics, we give antacids, and analgesics, antiemetics, and bronchodilators. I want to specify the analgesic part is very, very importantly here because you can see we when we write the post-operative orders, it is very, very important to space the 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 space the the timing of the uh, analgesics at regular intervals so that at every three hours or every four hours the patient is getting the adequate pain relief. So the the source of post can be at the at the site of the incision. The patient have one or two chest strains after the surgery. Uh, the patient have due to the position of the patient during the surgery, the patient will have uh, shoulder pain and the pleura pain. So there are so many uh, sources of the pain for a patient. So you have to use multimodal analgesia. So there are different sources. So you have to give the painkillers, the, the analgesics in different ways. That's why we call it as multimodal analgesia. Not only the IV painkillers is sufficient in patients with uh, uh, chest surgery, we most of the times we use 
epidural analgesia for adequate pain relief. The other important thing that we practice in our regular practice, uh, regular day-to-day uh, -day life is local urinary application. You can see here, this is a patient who underwent a thoracotomy for a surgery, where you can see sister is actually taking the urinary gel in her hand and she is applying around the wound every two hourly, which will actually decrease the local muscle spasm and will give adequate pain relief for the patient. So this is one of the most important pain relief method we especially do for our chest surgical patients. So post-operative care can be in the ICU, in the ward, and at the time of discharge. In the ICU, as Deepika elegantly told, the patient has to be given regular nebulizations. The patient should be mobilized as soon as possible. Within four to six hours after the surgery, we make the patient out of the bed. We make her sit on a chair. We do active limb physiotherapy, deep breathing exercises, uh, breath holding exercises, and repeated chest percussions and chest vibrations so that the post-operative secretions, the post-operative secretions that accumulate in her bronchus, she can actively cough out and so that the patient will have no bronchospasm, no, uh, uh, no breathing difficulty, and the patient has better recovery. So once the patient is fit to shift from the, from the ICU, we shift them to the ward. So what is the post-operative care in the ward? It is actually a graded kind of uh, physiotherapy that we follow in our unit. So once the patient is in the ICU, I've shown you the pictures how uh, we do the physiotherapy. Once the patient shifted to the ward, we do the shoulder movement so that shoulder dysfunction doesn't happen after the surgery. The patient should be doing various flexion maneuvers, the deep breathing and the breath holding, uh, uh, the breath holding exercises will continue. And the, we have a dedicated physiotherapy room where the treadmill, cycling, and the uh, cross trainer, all these exercises, the patient will be continuing. So this is, this is the uh, aspect of the post-operative physiotherapy. Now, the second pillar of the post-operative, uh, the third pillar of post-operative care is the post-operative nutrition. So as Dr. Uh, Sukram uh, very elegantly said, the, we continue to give the post-operative patients a high calorie and the high protein diet where we at least target a 3,000 calorie and 100 grams of protein in case of non-diabetic patients and 2,000 calorie, 100 gram protein in diabetic patients. You can see a patient, this is our, uh, our, our own patient, where the patient is allowed to take orally and if the adequacy of the oral intake is less, then we keep a rice soup and you can see that in the background picture, there is a rice soup, the, the feeding bag is here. We feed them every two hourly, three hourly, so that the patient is nutritionally uh, uh, prepared and will continue to have the good nutrition in the post-operative period. So the post-operative care doesn't stop in the ward. Our post-operative care continues at the time of discharge and even after the discharge. So at the time of the discharge, these three people are very essential components of the, at the time of discharge, we have the physiotherapist, which explains the physiotherapy to the patient, the dietitian, which explains the diet requirements that patients should be followed in the patient, and the ward nurse, which explains the medicines. And at the time of discharge, we explain the patient, uh, the, the discharge orders on these uh, 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 A, B, C, D, E, F. A means activity, B means bathing is required or not, the commitment to the work, the diet, the exercise, and the fun and family life. On these headings, we actually explain the discharge process to the patients. At the time of discharge, these are the routine post, the discharge orders that we give, which includes painkillers, the bronchodilators, and rest of supportive medications. And the, the story doesn't stop there. And after discharge, we follow up the patient physically every alternate day for almost three to four times. And we continue to follow up these patients telephonically, at least for next two to three months. So this is the journey, how we manage a case in the post-operative period. So if you want the, the thoracic surgical patient to go happily after the surgery, you have to counsel the patient before the surgery very well. You have to explain the physiotherapy exercises before the surgery. And the, the physiotherapy, the, the post-operative care regimen should be tailored depending on the patient conditions. The patient should be taken care in the ICU with the exercise that I said. The patient should be given adequate pain relief. The patient should be uh, doing good exercises in the ward. And at the time of discharge, he should be, he or she should be 
explain the discharge orders very precisely. So the most important thing is the adequate pain relief, good nutrition, and aggressive physiotherapy. These are the three pillars on which our post-operative uh, recovery actually depends on. Very thanks from the Institute of Chest Surgery, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, there is a question uh, that what do you give in epidural? In epidural analgesia, we actually give a combination of drugs or one drug or combination of drugs, depending on the uh, patient characteristics. We give uh, local anesthetic as well as opioid. This is the combination that we give. Example, opioid is we use uh, fentanyl and the local anesthetic we use is either bupivacaine or ropivacaine. The exact, the combination is dependent on the, the characteristics of the patient. Okay. So, Mohan, very, very elegantly explained, but I would just reiterate that lot of times the importance of pain relief in, the, in influencing the outcome of the patient is actually overlooked. And if you don't give complete pain relief, then you will have problems. In our ward, the dictum is, if patient is having pain, the resident and the nurse on duty is going to face the problem. Why is patient pain? Why is patient in pain? We don't go by fixed dose. For us, every patient has to be titrated separately. This is very important. Nutrition is often overlooked, and so is physiotherapy. So as he said, these are the three pillars. Uh, I don't see any more question, uh, Dr. Mohan. So you can go ahead with introducing the next speaker. As a continuation of the program, I would like to invite Ms. Neha Tiwari, who is the real force behind the organization of this meeting. And she is also the, the chief program coordinator of this present webinar. I'm really proud and happy to share with you all that she is the first dedicated chest surgery nursing coordinator in the country. And we have witnessed a paradigm shift in the management, in the management of our all chest surgical patients. And we have actually witnessed the better post-operative outcomes and the better patient satisfaction. So when we actually included when these people came into our unit and these act along with her there are there are two other coordinators these three people have actually revolutionized the 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 intra ward care and the post the post uh, discharge care of these chest thoracic surgical patients and she um, neha actually did uh, uh, general nursing from sir gangaram hospital and uh, she, after that she did basic bsc nursing from Medical Science University, Madhya Pradesh. She had various certification to her credit. She did certification course in critical care medicines for nurses from Sir Gangaram Hospital. And she, from the Train Nurses Association of India, she also had a certification course from Essential Upskilling for Nurses on COVID-19 Management. In addition, very importantly, she also had an online certification course from the health effects of climate change from Harvard University. She is also an esteemed member of uh, the Guinness World Record that has been conducted by Lung Care Foundation in 2017. In addition to that, she uh, worked as a critical care nurse in Sir Gangaram Hospital in, from 2016 and 17. And at the time when she was actually doing very well in the uh, critical care, uh, she joined chest surgery in 2017 in Sir Gangaram Hospital with us. And since then, for the last six years, she is associated with us. And she is a very, very important component of our day-to-day -day, uh, activities of the unit. So from that time, she is our thoracic nurse coordinator. She attended many, many conferences that we regularly do on our unit. And even she has international publications to her credit. And she, uh, he has... Uh, uh, reported her research work in European Society of Thoracic Surgery in Dublin conference. And she's active member of our Lung Care Foundation. And with this introduction, uh, I, would I would like to uh, hand over uh, the meeting to Neha. 
and the topic that she is going to discuss is a very very important if if you ask me that is the most important presentation of all the presentation that have been uh, told till now so this is regarding the management of post the intercostal drain it is the it is most important because it is the most pertinent topic that is related to a, a nursing personnel on day to day basis so uh, i wish all the best to neha and uh, hand over to you before you start neha uh, about neha dr mohan has already said i have nothing more to add i agree with what he has said but i want to talk about this topic friends uh, insertion of an icd is the most simple but i think the most complication causing procedure and we in our department are very passionate about spreading this information across the country so we've been traveling and talking about the the the, the technical aspects to residents across medicine surgery pediatric departments and we are very happy now to share this knowledge with our nursing uh, personnel friends across the country and uh, anyone who wishes will be very happy to share this information over to you neha uh, thank you sir and thank you so much dr mohan for your kind words uh, now moving forward to the presentation part i'll share my screen is it visible to all no just a moment is it visible now yeah go full screen yes sir yeah is it visible okay yeah uh, so i am covering the topic says insertion maintenance and removal of chest tube the nursing aspect as we know chest tube insertion is a common and simple procedure required at all age groups at hall hospital settings it may be required as a routine procedure as an emergency or it could be a life saving procedure although we know that the chest tube insertion is performed by doctors but from the time the decision is made to insert a chest tube to its removal it's our duty that we can play a crucial role and therefore our better understanding and knowledge of these practical steps can make a procedure safer with better outcome in the next 30 minutes i am going to discuss about the indications of chest tube insertion the various chest tubes the drainage system safe insertion in which how we can assist the doctors to enhance safety the maintenance of tube in the ward what to observe in the icds while transporting a patient whether we should clamp the chest tube or not the indications for the removal how we can safely remove the chest tube what are the post chest tube removal actions and the complications and the last the special situations so indications as we all know it is done for the drainage of collection of air in the pleural cavity which is in the form of pneumothorax or it could be in the form of tension pneumothorax it is to drain out the fluid in the pleural cavity which could be in the form of pleural effusion empyema hemothorax or chylothorax we place chest tube in the collection of air and fluid both combination in the pleural cavity which is can be form of pyonemothorax hydronemothorax and hemonemothorax which is of traumatic or it can be related to any other disease condition we also insert chest tubes in the cardiac surgery in our pulmonary in mediastinal pleural or esophageal surgery in the post pneumonectomy cases and also in bronchopleural fistula cases now coming to the chest tubes there are different 
types of chest tubes available and the sizes. So two points are very important here, the types and the size. Now coming to the types of chest tubes, we have simple straight tubes, which are of, which are of straight angled and the other one is of the curved tube, which are angled tubes. These angled tubes are used mostly in the cardiac cases, while these straight tubes are most commonly used. These straight tubes, if you can see it, it here, there are multiple eyelets at the distal end of the tube. Now coming to the trocar chest tube, these trocar chest tubes are still used at many centers, but we don't use this tube and we don't recommend to use the chest tube insertion for with trocar chest tube because the trocar chest tube is having this metal trocar protruding out, which may cause any complication while inserting the chest tube. So we don't recommend to use the trocar chest tube. Next is Melicot catheter. Melicot catheter is a rubber kind of catheter, which is being used and commonly used at many centers across India. This is of rubber and sometimes also of plastic catheter. The another one catheter is of pigtail catheter. This pigtail catheter is named because of its resemblance like pigtail. If you can see it here, the pigtail catheter is resembles of a pigtail, just like a pig tails is, same like the catheter. So the pigtail catheter is mostly used by the radiologist in putting chest tube insertion. Now coming to the sizes of the chest tube, there are different sizes available, which is of 8 French to 40 French. But we commonly use 12 to 36 French chest tubes. Chest tube sizes is depend on the what pathology we are putting, in what patients we are putting chest tube, and the commonly used sizes available is in adult patients, we use 28 to 32 French. In child, we use 16 to 20 French. In adult, we use 24 to 28. And in newborn patient, uh, we use 20, 12 French. The smaller the size of the tube, it will cause the lesser pain. Now, having discussed about the indications and various chest tubes, now we'll cover the next topic is the drainage system. So the drainage system is of two types. Either it is the underwater seal system or the now available commercial made chest drainage units. The underwater seal system are of two types. Either it is in the form of drainage bag or it is in the form of drainage bottle. Drainage bottle could be of single chamber also or double chamber also. This drainage bag if we can see, uh, see it properly, this drainage bag is having this tube inside, which is going till the bottle. This drainage bag is having this tube, which is going till the bottom of, and the water is being placed inside, which is work as a trap, so that the no air can go inside and sucked inside the lung. So water is being used over in the underwater seal system to, as a trap. Now, when we cover the chest tube bags with the other two bags, the abdominal bag and the Euro bag, you can find it here that the chest tube bag, as I told, is the tube which is going till the bottom and being trapped inside the water. Where in the abdominal bag, there is no tube going inside. And same in the Euro bag, there is no go tube going inside. So whenever we have a patient in which we are uh, connecting a chest tube bag, we must ensure that we use correct bag. Now, the second is underwater seal bottle. Uh, still earlier, in many cases uh, in the center, we use this saline bottle in which two tubes are on the top, which can help to take the air out. But now in the coming days, we have this single water, single chamber bottle and this double chamber bottle with the upgraded form. Now we don't use this saline glass bottle, but still at some places or at some centers, we use this saline glass bottle. Now coming to the chest drainage bag and the chest drain bottle, as I show you the chest drainage bag 
is very easier to manage. The patient can do his routine activities by tucking the chest tube bag with under his clothes. But the disadvantage of the chest tube bag is the patient, there is a very higher risk of toppling. That means there are chances that the drain fluid can come out and spill on the floor. While in the chest tube bottle, we have this advantage that there is no lesser risk of toppling and spillage. And we can also connect the negative suction to the chest tube bottle. But the disadvantage is that the chest tube bottle is always visible. It can't be hidden. Now coming to the uh, drainage, other commercial units, we have wet dry system and the dry system. In the wet system, as I told you, the water is being used as a seal to trap so that the no air can go inside the lungs. But in the dry system, there is a mechanical valve. I'll show you the picture, which will help as a seal so that no air can go inside. In the wet dry system, we have atrium and plurivac available in the market. And in the dry system, now medlar, topaz, and atmos. And we, are, we have been common, use this medlar, atmos, and topaz very commonly in our patients. Now, this is the wet dry system, the plurivac. The plurivac is connected with a suction. And here is the negative regulator for which we can you know, adjust the suction. And at the end, there is a water seal which can show us the air leak of the patient. Now in this dry system, the synapse system, here is the uh, regulator to control the negative per pressures. And here is, this is the mechanical valve, which I told you about that this will help to prevent the air going sucking inside the lung. Now, the most advanced device is this Medla device, which is having a display which can show up, show us about the leak, what the leak is, and what the pressure is. So it's a very beautiful device where we can see the leak of the patient for the last 72 hours and what suction we have applied on the patient. Now coming to the next safe insertion and here how we can assist the doctors to enhance safety. Now, while inserting a, inserting a chest tube, we must ensure that the consent is taken. We must ensure that we have explained the patient the procedure in detail so that he can cooperate with the satisfaction. If advisable, pre-medication must be given and intravenous lines should always be there if the patient goes into any dehydration or hypovolemic shock. We must check that the oxygen is on flow and the pulse oximeter is available to check the saturation level of the patient. And ICD set having instruments with to drape and to suture and the analgesic. The chest tube should always be take two so that even if in case one chest tube falls on the ground, we should, re we, we should be ready with the second one and the drainage system. Now coming to the procedure set, uh, to the very left uh, at your hand, you can see a sponge holder, a scalpel, knife, a long forcep, two artery forceps, a needle holder, and the very important is this silk, the cutting suture. We should always make sure the suture we are giving to the doctors is of the cutting needle. It should not be straight or any other suture. We should always give, uh, always give the cutting needle to the doctors and along with sterile gauze pieces. Now, it's an often asked question where we should put the chest tube, whether we should put the chest tube in the OT or in the ward. We can't take the patients every time in the OT to put chest tube. It's, it, it is to be done in the ward also. But the thing is, ki we should always prepare the patient while putting, uh, uh, before putting the chest tube properly. We should make sure that there is no uh, asepsis is there because we are entering the chest. And if we enter the chest with any sort of asepsis, there are chances that we cause empyma to the patient. By entering and putting the chest tube, we have damage to the patient. So while preparing, while uh, coming to the position of the patient, 
the chest tube is always insert in the supine position with the right hand upward or if we are putting it on the left side then in the po supine position with the left hand upward it can also be placed in the supine uh, it can also be placed in the sitting position or in the lateral position cleaning and draping is very important part sometimes uh, happen that the doctors are busy and they ask the nurses to clean and drape the patient we should do it in a complete sterile way so the scrubbing part starts from the nape of the neck uh, till the bottom of the belly we should cover the wide area of the scrubbing and the same way we should cover it with proper draping just leaving the area of interest exposed now uh, the next is about the preparing underwater seal while the doctors are placing the chest tube we should keep keep our chest tube bottle whether it is single chamber or double chamber we should keep the uh, underwater seal ready and the moment the chest tube is inserted we should connect it with the underwater seal now i am not going into the details of the chest tube insertion once the chest tube is inserted by the doctors the next step is the proper stitching is very important so there should be no slipping of the chest tube it should be the suture should be completely snugly fitting around the chest tube it should not be like the chest tube is moving in and out so the chest tube dressing uh, we need is benzoin dinoplast ether tegaderm sterile gauze pieces and sterile cotton while putting benzoin near the chest tube this acts as a seal so that no infection can penetrate and over the benzoin seal we always apply a tegaderm now we cover the chest tube surroundings with a sterile benzoin seal and with a tegaderm and then we cut the gauze piece halfway to cover it like this and then apply the dinoplast dressing over it now we apply the two layers of dinoplast dressing the one from the above and the another one from the below and then we apply this flag which acts as a primary strapping here you can see a patient where the primary strapping is there and also the secondary strapping is there so even if in case the tube may uh, 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 inadvertently pull out or it may get something uh, you know uh, tail in that scenario your dressing should be very adequate and firm and this primary and secondary strapping will help to place the tube correctly now what happen when the uh, first string the first suture is not taken uh, accurately or correctly then in that scenario this peri brain soakage and spoiling of the clothes can happen so we should must ensure that the first suture the first string is taken correctly now coming to the maintenance of the tube in the ward we have two actions to take care number one is about post icd insertion and number two is about the emptying of bottle once the tube is placed we must auscultate the air entry we should get a chest x ray done we should never never ever drain more than 1 liter if the patient is having massive pleural effusion and in that scenario we drain more than 1 liter there are chances that patient may land up into respiratory distress and the re expansion of pulmonary edema can happen so we should always drain less than 1 liter or about 1 liter we should not drain more than that in one go next is pain relief we always take care of the pain relief part because after the uh, insertion of chest tube patients many a times complains of the pain and here we should ensure that the pain killers are sufficiently given to the patient along with that the breathing exercises and the patient's movement is very important as already discussed by uh, dr dipika and dr mohan that in the post operative patients and after the chest tube of any patient 
we always take care that the patient do his physical movement and the breathing exercise now the pain relief we can given in the form of oral also and in the form of injectable and if the case is of any trauma or any rift fracture is there in that scenario while putting chest tube we also ensure that the patient is having epidural catheter and the pain is not there now coming to the next point the emptying of chest tube this emptying of chest tube is a very important part where we nurses can play an important role so while emptying the chest tube we should do it in a very aseptic technique the mouth of the bottle and the tube should not touch any unsterile object and while putting the saline inside the bottle we should always make sure that the saline surface also not touch any unsterile object and then we should place the uh, tube inside the bottle now next is what to observe in icd so the drainage i of icd is of three type whether it could be serous drainage we can call it as serous sanguinous whether it is sanguinous in a form of bloody drainage we can say or the drainage in in the form of purulent also in the pussy collection sort of drainage now here so two important aspects i have discussed the drainage nature what is the nature of the drainage and the other is the air leak we have to check whether the air leak is present or not when the patient breathe in and breathe out you can see the amount of leak is present so we should always check the nature and the air leak now while coming to the transport of patient with a chest tube whether we should clamp it or not so while transporting the patient for a chest x ray or a ct scan or wherever we must ensure that we should not clamp the tube continuous drainage is the safest approach even when the patient is on the ventilatory support on the positive pressure ventilation and on the continuous positive pressure ventilation we should always uh, drain the system we should ne never clamp the chest tube and ensure that the drainage bottles are always kept at a lower level so that the no fluid is going back inside the pleural cavity while changing the icd bottles we can clamp the tube for a very short period next come to the indications for removal now the indications of the removal is lung should be fully expanded clinically and radiologically it should be a very good air entry there should be no air leak present in the last 24 hours no fresh altered or pussy collection is there and the drainage in the last 24 hours is 100 to 200 ml now comes the safe removal while well, safe removal is done by doctors but we should make sure that the position is correct patient should be in the supine position or in the lateral position and take proper cooperation with the patient and the relatives while removing the chest tube proper stitch handling is there and while removing the chest tube we should always ensure there is no residual avoid so we can avoid pneumothorax now what are the post chest tube removal actions the post chest tube removal actions are we should always auscultate do a chest x ray breathing exercises pain relief normal movement and the exercises of the patient and a definitive treatment so chest tube insertion is a life saving procedure and a simple procedure causing large number of complications simple to life threatening and sometimes to death as well if we adhere to basic principles we can avoid most of them now in case of loculated pleural effusion we can take the guidance of ultrasound we can put the chest tube in the ultrasound guidance so the last slide is about take home message is safe insertion how we can assist doctors in the safe insertion of chest tube maintenance and daily emptying of bottles and to check what the nature of the drain is and whether the leak is present or not we should always ensure that the patient is having enough pain relief nutrition is very important as already discussed by dr mohan 
when, where, and how to remove the chest tube. And there should no not post removal pneumothorax after the removing of chest tube. And definitive treatment to be given to the patient. So safe chest tube insertion is every patient's right and every nurse's duty. Let us join hands together and achieve it. And at last, I say thanks from Institute of Chest Surgery to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Neha, there are many questions and I'll just put these to you. First question is what measures to take for accidental removal of chest tube? This question has just been asked. Uh, so if in case the accidental removal of chest no, tube... No, 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 no. No, he is asking what measures to take to prevent accidental removal of chest tube. Right. So to prevent uh, the accidental removal of chest tube, this is why we have shown, uh, this is why I have shown the dressing. We should always apply the primary strapping and the secondary strapping. And daily in the morning, we should check the patient is having secondary strapping. Secondary strapping will help to prevent any inadvertently pull out of the chest tube. Okay, so there is a question. Can we use Cydex as a water seal? No, we cannot use Cydex. We can only use normal saline as a water in the underwater seal system. We can only use saline, no other uh, fluid or no other liquids to be used. The next question is, uh, why have you said that drain bag should be below chest level? So the drain bag or the chest tube bottle should always be below the chest level. The reason behind is if the drain bag and the bottle is at the parallel or at the same level of the bed, or the chest of the patient, then in that scenario, the fluid can may go back to the pleural cavity. And therefore, we always ask the patient and the nurses to keep the chest tube bag and the chest tube bottle below the level of the chest. What is the difference between single chamber and double chamber drainage? My God, I think everybody has questions only on this topic. So what is the difference between single and double chamber? Amandeep Kaur has asked this question. So uh, Amandeep, uh, the difference between single chamber bottle and the double chamber bottle is both are the same. But the difference is the single chamber bottle is easy to carry. It is just of 500 ml and very easy to carry by patient. While in the double chamber bottle, it is of 2000 ml. It is very heavy when the patient's fluid is 1 liter or 1200 liter. So that's why we ask always the uh, nurses to apply single chamber bottle. And one more reason we prefer single chamber bottle that the cost of the double chamber bottle is somewhere around 2000, while the cost of the single chamber bottle is somewhere around 900 to 1000. Okay, uh, there are lots of more questions. I think I'll stop here because we have a very, very important panel discussion coming. Rest of the questions, I will answer. Uh, stop sharing screen, uh, Neha. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, coming up about chest tube. Uh, this is a message to my colleagues. I always keep telling my colleagues that if you want to teach chest surgery to everyone, just teach ICD insertion. That's enough of chest care or thoracic surgical care. So all those questions I will answer after the panel discussion. Don't worry, all the questions which you people have put, we will stay back and answer each. But right now, I'm very excited about a very, very important next part of the presentation, which is a panel discussion about the, the uh, thoracic surgical nursing as a super specialty, the very reason for which this conference today has been organized. And I'm very, very happy to announce that we have a very esteemed panel available here. My panelists are first and foremost, Mr. Binod, 
uh, who's the director nursing at Medanta Gurugram, uh, who's already been introduced uh, right in the beginning. So I'll uh, uh, skip, uh, skip that. Uh, I have pleasure in introducing Lieutenant Colonel Sandhya B. Nair, who is presently Deputy Nursing Superintendent and Head of Training Department at Medanta Gurugram. She has over 25 years experience in hospital. She's actually a FOGI, a veteran from armed forces, specializing in transplant. She's been a transplant coordinator. She's also an MBA in hospital administration. She's uh, appreciated by United Nations, awarded Swami Narayan Award for Best Transplant Coordinator, awarded Asia Pacific Excellence Award as a super woman achiever. Uh, 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 Sister Nair, it's a pleasure to have you here. As also, <laughs> next is Miss Mini, uh, who is presently nursing superintendent at Vedanta Gurugram with over 27 years of experience in the hospital. She's an NABH and JCI internal auditor and coordinator, MBA in hospital administration, Six Sigma Excellence Green Belt. That frightens her. Is it the Karate Belt? And she was awarded POP by 1718. Welcome, Ms. Mini. Uh, next, I have pleasure in introducing Mrs. Nancy Joseph, who is presently Deputy Nursing Superintendent at Medanta, with 30 plus years of experience. Again, Six Sigma Excellent Green Belt, mentor, coordinator, counselor, and expert in handling critical care uh, equipment. And then we have pleasure in welcoming Ms. Sandeep Kaur, who is presently a nursing supervisor. And she is actually the in charge of the dedicated thoracic surgery board that we have. She has 17 years of experience, post BSc in nursing from Baba Farid University, BLS, ACLS, NMDP, and also got Best Performer Award in Medanta. We also have uh, uh, Ms. Prasila and Ms. Sutarita, the uh, CNOs at uh, our Lucknow and Patna units who are present. And if they wish to add to any of the questions, we'll be happy. So welcome to the esteemed panel. Uh, we have discussed today, and going by the response that we have had, over 4,600 registrations from across the country. I think there is a lot of excitement about this field. So my first question will be to Mr. Vinod. Uh, what is the need for this uh, specialized training program in thoracic nursing? We already have so many programs today. Why add another chapter? What is the need? Mr. Vinod. Thank you, sir, for all the introduction. So my job is done, I mean, because for the last uh, for five hours, I mean, we have been listening I mean, to why the importance of thoracic nursing. And with the response, what we are getting from each of them, I think, I mean, how many of them are going to join? I mean, Madanta, I don't know. So this is something that uh, the world is moving towards super specialization. And nursing is uh, no new, I mean, department, which needs to update its skill and which needs to move on, I mean, from with the doctors, it's not only that when we say partners in care, it's not only by the saying, it has to be by the practice also. So when we have super specialization by the doctors in every single field, it is equally important that the nursing also gets updated. Nursing also needs to move I mean, towards, I mean, that kind of a skill and comp competency, I mean, for the nursing skills also to ensure that our patients go safe from the hospital. Yeah. Uh, actually, that very well, very well said, Mr. Binod, that uh, uh, this was highlighted during the presentation also, that actually the doctors provide the treatment, but it is the, uh, and I always say that we visit the patient maybe for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the best in 24 hours. But the people who provide care on site, 24 by 7, and whose level of care actually impacts the outcome is the nurses in the ward. And if you have the best operation done, but the patient comes and is not looked after equally best, then the outcome will not be good. So very clear message from Mr. Vinod that while we develop the specialties of pulmonary 
and uh, 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 chest surgery, there is a need for similar specialized cadre to develop in chest nursing. My next question is to Lieutenant Colonel Sandhya. Lieutenant Colonel Sandhya has been in the forefront of developing various teaching training programs uh, in Vedanta. She's very actively involved with teaching and training. Uh, uh, Madam, being the frontliners in introducing such specialty courses, how uh, we can support this program and how do we uh, sort of go ahead and, and develop this as a super specialty? Madam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this honor. Um, to uh, begin with, under the leadership and guidance of the chairman himself, we have formulated a module like other speciality, which is totally ev highly evidence based. And it is a completely comprehensive module of six months, which the first batch will be bordered on April. And we actually aim that post completion of this course, the nurses will be knowing exactly the what is the standard oper operative pro protocols of the thoracic department, the basic the anatomies, diagnostic pro procedures, assessment and the basic nursing, medical, surgical, as well as the nursing management of thoracic surgeries, and so that a complete holistic care has been given to the patients and also to support the, the patient's attendance in a long-term follow-up. Thank you, sir. Okay, right. So, so, so today's program is like a, 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 like a curtain raiser. It's just giving you a brief, brief, just say, just, which is called the trailer. It's like a trailer of a movie. We've just given you an overview of her, but there is a need for uh, specialized uh, nurses to go into details of each of these programs. And uh, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sandhya, for taking a lead. I think it's a very, very important role that you have played. Now, I have a, a set of questions. What are the emerging roles for these nurses to practice safe nursing care and meet the high level of expectations of people. And a coupled question is, how is a thoracic nurse different from a critical care nurse? And I'll put this question to uh, Ms. Jensi and Ms. Minnie. Either one of you can answer either of the questions. Uh, Madam, uh, Ms. Minnie, you are on mute. Please unmute yourself. Okay, sir. Well, we all are about the, we all are aware about the nursing. Nursing is having a lot of changes in comparison to the previous era. Nowadays, nurses are stepping out of the shadow depending upon the situation and the need. She can be the either uh, care coordinator, team leader, an advocate, an educator, and a physician assistant. Everything, lot of chances is there. Patient feel much more comfortable with the nurses than else than other. Because they are with the 24 into 7 with the patient itself only. Patient can share their issues, concerns with them. At that time, nurses can guide them in the proper way, which can help, which can help the clients in the proper guidance and proper direction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so very clear message from you, uh, 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 Sister Mini, that nurses role today, and there is a very important message that she has given. Nurses' role is not just going and giving injections or checking temperature. As she very elegantly said, she's an educator, she's a coordinator, and there are many, many roles which nurses have to play, not only within the hospital, outside the hospital also. Uh, Sister the Jensi. Second, second question is there, uh, what is the difference in between this thing? Uh, Sister, Mini, and Sister Mini, maybe Sister Jensi can take this question. Would you? I will give that answer. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. So, yes, of course, the drastic difference is there. And uh, the best example is that the conference is held today. So, we, we all are aware our hospital is having JCA and NABH accredited hospital. Now, we are moving for the nursing excellence certification. For that reason, we, have, we are doing a lot of audit. That audit is uh, showing the result that all the nursing indicators like a bed sore, pressure ulcer, patient fall, medication error, everything is zero in that thoracic department. 
and thor thoracic one more the um, big advantage means thoracic unit is always lightening whenever we are working on the thoracic unit it was silent mode all the nurses are busy with their patients and they are giving a good care moreover the patients whoever is going our organization they are giving a excellent feedback about the nursing care about the thoracic surgery each and everything so all the credit is going to the uh, dr arvind and team because of their guidance the nurses are achieving this much goal in that department okay uh, sister jency i would like your comments also on both these very pertinent issues these are very important questions that's why i thought i'll take answers from both of you you might be you know adding something more than what sister mini has said yes sir definitely thank you for your fabulous uh, introduction sir and yes nurses are like specialty nurses always education is a good initiative and it gives an opportunity to the nurses sister jency unmute yourself thank you yeah you are unmuted go ahead jency sir there are so many examples in the print of me it was happened and one of our student from cardiac specialty was got appreciation from ceo for his excellent nursing care and uh, recently one of uh, our two neurology nurses got acknowledged from chairman of neurology for their instant management of patient who is having epilepsy uh, sister jency you again have gone mute please unmute maybe some button is getting pressed thank you sir and myself uh, being a uh, orthopedic nurse and i have taken many critical decision during emergency situation specialty nurse certification offers nurses an advanced knowledge based on enhanced competencies skill and qualification sir okay okay so there is a very clear message emerging from across the panel that one there is a need to uh, you know uh, uh, another another thing i hear and while talking to uh, principals of many colleges uh, i when i said that this is the first of its kind course and i'm sharing this with you and i would like this response from from um, from mr vinod prasila and sucharita also while i was calling up people i was told there is already a cardio thoracic program existing so this question was put to me that when there is a cardio thoracic program existing at many places what is the need for a thoracic uh, stream to develop now any of you can can respond i have some answer to that but i'll give it afterwards i would like to hear because three four places when i made calls just to inform people i was given this this message that we already have a cardio thoracic stream why do you want to start this separate thoracic stream any one of you vinod would you like maybe maybe i'll try first and then prasila and this is that again sure 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 so in the beginning i mean of the presentation as you said i mean thoracic nursing i mean people used to think it's only of uh, tb so thoracic is thoracic nursing is not only tb there are i mean i am sure that people would have learnt i mean what is the scope and how deep is uh, chest surgery or thoracic surgery from the last 4 hours i mean presentation what we had so to deal with these kind of i mean patients it's not something i mean easy for a nurse who is a generalist nurse i mean to deal with these kind of patients where like for example you can see the questions of icd is still more coming so with this we can see i mean what is the necessity for a specialized i mean nursing for thoracic after chest surgery and we have been dealing i mean with uh, the cardiac or the uh, bypass uh, patients i mean for uh, long years now now this specialty is something that which is booming and definitely people want to grow in specific specialty like i mean yesterday when we had a discussion i mean in orthopedics orthopedics started with a single thing of bone now i mean by god i can even see i mean remember and see that there are specialist even for only for the thumb now if that kind of specialization is happening in our medical field why not i mean for nurses sure sure i would like comments from uh, uh, sister prasila and uh, uh, sucharita a brief comment 
is cardiothoracic specialization in the presence of that because that specialization is there at many places is there a need to proceed with thoracic definitely when we are talking about the cardiothoracic it is a part of the organ which we are leading with a heart and especially when we are talking about the chest and uh, chest surgery so we are leading with a various kind of scenes the trachea then uh, larynx pharynx so all these area we are going with the lungs and uh, alveoli all these things so there is two specific region one is a heart and another one is a lung so they are supposed to be a nas different kind of nursing care which we have seen since now in the throughout the throughout our all the sessions and uh, again and again that uh, it is uh, depends upon on the audit depends upon on the first movement of the patient depends upon on the drugs and the drugs also are different from the cardiothoracic which we are using specially and the nursing care also after post operative management also there is a little bit which we found there is a difference in the post operative management and pre operative preparation so all these things we definitely we need to know the uh, chest surgery regarding post operative management for sure. the better come for the sure. patient sure. so sure. definitely there is a requirement of yeah. the different okay thank you is is the sister priscilla there priscilla are you there no i think she's busy so i would tell you the the perspective from the from the Uh, doctor side now this has been going on for last so many years across the country we had a uh, mch in cardiothoracic center in cardiothoracic centers across the country only cardiac surgery was done only cardiac surgery was taught and thoracic part was never discussed never <coughs> taught and therefore the people who trained did not know and therefore they did not do and since they did not do they did not teach and this was a vicious cycle which was going on for the last 40 50 years and this exactly was the argument we had with the national board in the year 2012 and 13 we gave them enough evidence uh, to the effect that chest is a different area from heart it's just anatomical thing that heart and lungs both happen to be the chest inside the chest but in terms of the disease spectrum in terms of the presentation of patient in terms of the post operative outcome in terms of management these are two totally different streams and therefore clubbing them together will never work it was a marriage which was bound to fail uh, if i may use that word and therefore separating cardiac and thoracic and developing both specialties is the is the important and this is exactly what united states and europe did many many decades ago that they had uh, the people doing their fellowship and then you had a cardiac stream and you had a thoracic stream and i think the same thing holds true in the nursing area also that thoracic nursing and cardiac nursing will be two different uh, games and therefore there is a clear cut need to keep them separate uh, sister sandeep i'll come to you i you are the sister in charge of of our thoracic surgery ward i have some uh, ward practical issues but before that i'll just uh, take a few more questions with uh, our other panelists don't think i'm uh, not aware you are there i'm coming back coming to you uh, my next question is that burnout syndrome in nurse is common occupational hazard so this question is to uh, colonel sandhya do you feel that developing this super specialty will be helpful or it will actually increase the chances of burnout syndrome how do you correlate burnout syndrome to this prospect of developing thoracic nursing definitely sir because burnout syndrome is quite common among nurses and why it happens because of the meanness and happiness you are ha happy with your work with your workplace you de definitely will not have burnout syndrome and what happens in speciality is that you have you are more accountable you are more competent you are more take the ownership and you know what is a what to have what should be do, done and what should not be done you are very well competent in that area and moreover the ipr and the bond between the team members are enormous 
being a transplant nurse myself i know that because every day it's a, it's a next family for you i think i am uh, sir also will truly agree with me so being in a specialty is that you're happy at your home and you're happy in your work so i don't think you will have a burnout syndrome in in, in a specialty area okay thank you i totally agree with you my next question is to uh, sister mini uh, sister being a nursing superintendent of the ipd area and uh, uh, you've been very instrumental in starting our uh, thoracic surgery ward shifting patients quickly what difference you see in the thoracic department thoracic ward compared to other other wards sir already i answered for that question that's all the indicator does data is zero like a patient for beds or medication error accidental removal of tube all this data we are collecting and all the data comparison to other department this thoracic ward is getting zero there is no complaints everything is perfectly going on and moreover the patients are so happy the nurses are always with the patient only uh, so that was because of all entire team and the one more advantage is there with that team means the team is uh, so very cooperative team uh, at any time we can work with the any anyone like okay. dr bilal dr harsh dr aravind dr aravind there is no wherever whenever we are going to other chairman we have to take an appointment in this team we no no need for taking any appointment anything else at any time we can work on at any time we can discuss whatever our concern 100% cooperation is with our team so that body is going well that was a sure. big success sure. because of dr arvind and team uh, i have a question to sister jency sister do you feel having dedicated thoracic nurse coordinators in a in a unit makes a difference to the outcome of the patients who are being operated now part of this answer was given by dr mohan and i would add because i have the probably largest experience of having a dedicated uh, cadre with me but i want your uh, views on that sister jency sir definitely is yes, sir thoracic nurse coordinators plays a major role in the quality patient care sir nurses assess and observe patients and help doctors to create a care plan and carry out that care plan with medication and treatment nurses use variety of equipment for both and performing treatment and they also do diagnostics sir thoracic nurses plays a pivotal role in patient quality care sir they have a huge role in preventing hospital acquired infection as these patients are always in lines and tubes as our nurses open and said there is no in our thoracic area there is no medication error and no patient fall like there is no hospital acquired infection also so i want to congratulate the whole team for a such a wonderful work sir yeah uh, uh, i would add here when we moved to uh, our previous hospital from from all india institute uh, in all india institute i did not have any such specialty uh, group with me when we moved to the previous hospital gangaram hospital for the first uh, uh, year or two we did not have any such specialized cadre uh, we were being helped by the general to teach people in the ward but then we feel that we need somebody who can uh, you know chip in between the the ward nurses and the things which residents were doing and when we requested the the nursing superintendent to give us girls and that is the time when actually neha joined us uh, in our unit and as dr mohan has said that once you are in a unit you are part of that family you only do that 24 by 7 your knowledge your practical knowledge theoretical knowledge level of involvement everything goes up and your performance becomes better as you perform better you are given more responsibility as you deliver more you are given more you are excited to learn more so it goes into a positive cycle and actually i have i look forward to a day where actually they become physician assistants you know those kind of new cadres can develop so definitely the answer is that thoracic surgery having a dedicated cadre will be very important 
Now let me come to Sister Sandeep. Sister Sandeep, you unmute yourself, please. You are in charge of the, uh, first of all, congratulations, because this ward is actually the first 36 bed exclusive thoracic surgery ward. Such a big uh, 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 congregation of thoracic surgical patients at one place is not there in any other hospital. You are managing this ward. I want to know that when you move from your previous job to this job, what was the immediate difference you noticed in the patient profile, in the problems that you were facing, and how you overcame that? That's first question. And I have one more question before I come to Mr. Vinod for a very, very important question. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for my warm welcome and warm introduction, sir. And uh, uh, thanks for the question, sir. It's a nice question. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are audible. Go ahead, Sandeep. According to my experience, a critical care nurse uh, is handling all types of patients. And when I have moved to the thoracic department, before that, my 12 years experience is in the, only in cardiac unit. Cardiac unit in ICUs only, in Amritsar Fortis Hospital. But uh, when I moved to the, this hospital, I have only experienced with pediatric patients for five years. But since three months, last three months, I am working with Dr. Arvind Kumar, and I have a lot of experience with sir. Actually, a drastic change happened because sir has conducted, Dr. Arvind has conducted Zoom classes for the nurses on the floor by Zoom classes twice weekly. And they are more benefited for us. And being in this department, under the guidance of Dr. Arvind, we have formulated some SOPs which includes post-operative protocols for our wards, such as, such as early ambulation and deep breathing exercises for the patient. That is most benefited for the patient early recovery. And with the help of our whole team, our nurses are able to deal with thoracic conditions on their own level. And they also encourage our nurses to think out of the box. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, uh, Sister Sandeep, you raised a very, you brought out a very pertinent point there. I thank you for reminding me. This is an experience I want to share with all of you that when we got uh, about 38 uh, nurses for our newly started board, uh, none of them had prior experience of uh, handling chest patients. And I thought that unless they know about whatever we have discussed about the anatomy, about the diseases, about what we do. We used to go and say, this patient has had open surgery, this is robotic. You know, it's all like French and Latin. So we decided, and this was a COVID time, so physical classes were not possible. So we took Zoom classes for them, where we empowered them about the various diseases, the presentation that I made in the morning, what are the diseases, how we treat, how a thoracotomy patient needs more intensive pain relief compared to a VATS patient. And we shared a lot of information. And friends, I'm very happy to share with you that when we started empowering them, it, it was a radical transformation that we noticed in those girls. Those girls who used to be scared of us, they used to be running, running away, you know, when we'll go for the round. They started coming to us. They started asking us questions. We would reply. And the entire relationship actually changed, changed for the better. So this is something that when you have one board catering to one type of patient, I think empowering the girls working in that ward in details of that subject will definitely get much better cooperation from them. Uh, sister, you also have a certain a nine P's uh, that we, we practice in the ward. Do you want to just quickly share this? Yes, sir, of course, yes. There are nine P's when the patient, when patient came to us post-operatively, we always assess the patient with nine P's. First of all, we assess the patient with pain. Patient is having any pain because in my ward, in thoracic surgery ward, in our ward, there is a zero pain policy. Zero yeah. pain policy Sandeep, in just, our ward. Just mention, just mention the nine P's because uh, we need to finish. So don't describe, just mention the nine P's. So pain. Right, sir. First is pain, then pyrexia, pallor, uh, potty, pedal edema, PAO2, means saturation. Pulse, pulse pressure. Pulse, uh, pulse pressure, 
blood pressure means partial pressure pressure and uh, pattern of respiration yeah pattern of respiration so Thank so yes, so friends what i want to share is one day we were talking to her and we were discussing how we can have a system them where the girls when they come for duty there are certain minimum points that they can check in the wards and while discussing i said oh you need to ask about pain you need to ask about and suddenly we just came up with this nine p's and now we have printed these nine p's in the form of a paper and laminated it and put it on the bed side in in every room where as soon as the girls come they look at pain color pressure uh, pyrexia pattern of respiration uh, pedal edema whether they have past body or not so these are very basic things but in a structured day it gets done three times a day every time the shift changes and i think it's made a difference to the care sandeep thank you very much for those brilliant inputs vinod i am coming to you for two thank um, you sir uh, political kind of question one is uh, you know monetary gains are a big incentive for somebody to put in an extra effort go for more education you think there is a need for a special incentivization in the field of thoracic nursing to get brilliant people here definitely sir i won't say yeah the definitely i won't like you if you give me <laughs> definitely i won't shy away from telling that and uh, i think i mean uh, we actually copy a lot of things in western model which benefits us and especially i mean when it comes to things i mean where we we, we want to shed out money i mean we do not copy i mean those kind of concepts yes i don't shy away from uh, telling that but i think we wanted to be a pioneer and we wanted to be a first mover advantage i mean at madanta so when we started with specialty programs and definitely i mean with the other specialty programs we have started and as i mentioned i mean we would be starting the thoracic uh, super specialty nursing program i mean from april onwards we made it clear and we ensured that we definitely incentivize our nurses who go through this program and come out successfully which definitely would uh, ensure that our patient care in the hospital would improve and our patients go safe so definitely there's no doubt that i mean we should incentivize and when we think that i mean we want to improve the skill and competency of people it doesn't come with any kind of free i mean thing we have to incentivize and we have to ensure that we take care monetarily also i mean the nurses if we need to improve their status okay my second part of uh, uh, this question is uh, do you think it's okay for hospitals stand alone hospitals or hospital group of hospitals to be starting these programs or you think there is a need for accreditation of these programs from something like indian nursing council or other institutions to make them you know more uh, give them more teeth to these programs so of course i mean we i mean we know that our government systems are not so easy for us to maneuver things and definitely the private organizations and private hospitals have taken a lot of uh, uh, hands on i mean training people for their own need but definitely this uh, for quite some time i mean for their own need has become i mean the need of the country also and then if one private hospital definitely recognizes the course which is done in a private in a different private hospital but having said this i mean when you enter into a government setup definitely there are some regulations i mean which require that it has to be accredited it has to be having a recognition with government body and all those things i think i mean it works i mean for government setup for private setup and for outside the country i think i mean this goes on very well because we have seen that challenge being uh, absorbed i mean with the number of courses what we are doing and definitely the nurses have become uh, beneficial i mean through this thank you thank you i think uh, 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 sister sandhya would you would you like to add anything to that we know that very uh, elegantly answered both the questions any any anything you want to add yes sir uh, like uh, whatever sir said absolutely it's uh, it's, it's a truth moreover because uh, like uh, in government like i come from another government set up my previous background but the thing is that it takes a lot of effort like indian nursing councils and all have formulated an accreditation program very very recently you can say if you are 5 years back or 10 years back but where the cmc bellur sri jitra armed forces have started this program with first with the ot at all in 70s 
so and then they were empowering nurses and they, the nurses were quite uh, competent once they come out of it they were taken with whole heartedly okay okay thank you so so i think uh, uh, we probably covered every aspect of the question related to developing this specialty now i leave the the floor open for any of the panelists mr vinod priscilla sucharita sister sandhya sister jensi sister mini sister sandeep any of the panelists want to add any more information to what we have discussed till now its floor is open to all of you anyone so on a lighter notes this is an open invitation for all the candidates i mean who have logged in i mean so anybody think of a thoracic nursing program or thoracic area you want to work your interest is on thoracic we are open to it in fact if i may <laughs> use uh, 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 an acronym uh, why not you know uh, 4600 people had registered and uh, over 2600 people have actually logged in on the zoom and youtube live at some point or the other so typically in all my webinars i used to see about one third conversion so number of people registering number of people participating will be one third but here it was almost half which is a fabulous number considering that it was done in a span of two weeks and i think it's it shows the interest and why not you you be explore the possibility of making a network it could be called a thoracic uh, 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 nurses network of india you know something like t n n i you could call it tini and uh, tini will become you know mega in in due course of time i would leave all of you with those thoughts not take any concrete step but while i was discussing with you this thought came to my mind that we can actually use this group which has shown the initial interest as a starting point for this can i request all my colleagues dr bilal dr harsh dr sukram dr mohan dipika neha to to join in because we are now towards the end of the program uh, i'll take about 5 10 minutes and quickly answer we had promised that we will answer all the questions so with the your permission what i'll do now feedback form has been shared please fill the feedback form because we'll be sending you this certificate based on the spelling there and we'll also look at our zoom data and youtube data and those who have participated will definitely get the feedback form on the email which you have uh, given now uh, i'll quickly run through these questions uh, first question is what are the if patient had large hemothorax how much volume we can drain at one shot uh, well for fluid uh, neha already answered that question that in 24 hours we don't drain more than uh, a liter when you have hemothorax then you need to drain it that is one part but while draining you also need to resuscitate the patient because if patient has a massive hemothorax he'll go into shock you need to give him blood transfusion and equally importantly you need to find out the cause and act on that a question is i have heard that water seal chest strains to be clamped while transporting neha answered that question very very clearly that if the patient has air leak that means the lung is leaking air and if you clamp the chest tube the air will accumulate inside it will cause i have seen hundreds of patients developing lung collapse because of the tube i would repeat the practice of clamping the chest tubes during transport is to be condemned the chest tube must be kept open always at all times in a patient who is having an air leak so next question is uh, uh immediate action after an accidental removal of chest drain neha you want to answer that immediate action after somebody has accidentally pulled out a chest tube uh yes sir so after the accident quick am audible yes so after the accident pull out of the chest tube at the time only we should apply a tight dressing and immediately go for a chest x ray of the patient 
very correct neha so if 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 someone comes to you sir my tube has come out what you do is to take a is if possible sterile and even if not pan sterile just put it there and seal that wound look at the patient's condition auscultate the chest there may be pneumothorax do a chest x ray see if pneumothorax is there and then proceed accordingly the question is uh, if water column is not moving what does it mean if water column is not moving it can mean two things one the chest tube may be blocked and the two if the lung becomes fully expanded then also the movement becomes them one message i want to give to all the nurses that more the movement in the water column more is the space inside that is the dictum we follow so in a well expanded lung the movement will be very minimal why should we put normal saline in romson's tube before insertion neha answered that question that if you do not have water being used as a trap you just have chest tube connected to the bottle then the with chest has negative suction why do we no trap in the in the chest because chest has negative pressure so with negative pressure the air gets sucked inside so you have to have a trap which could be in the form of water or in the form of a uh, 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 valve as she has explained if water column is not moving we have explained that at what level the icd should be inserted well neha did not go into the specific details because this goes to the uh, uh, the insertion area we carefully concentrated on only the nursing aspects and not on the insertion but just for your information the commonest site where the chest tube is inserted is in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line uh, how much negative pressure can be applied well uh, we sometimes go up to 20 30 40 50 also but typically we keep around 8 to 10 uh, centimeters of water why not clamp icd we have answered that immediate management if there is air leak remember if there is air leak the air has to be drained you have to keep the chest to patent and then you have to look for the reason and address the cause if immediate accidentally chest tube comes out is answered what is the column movement its importance i have answered this question can you answer about ventilation perfusion scan well this scan gives a ventilation that what is the distribution of ventilation and what is the distribution of perfusion we use it for predicting post operative uh, predicted feb1 in patients with borderline lung function what to do is drainage a lot of people have asked this question about accidental removal i would like to reiterate that the best way to prevent accidental removal as neha showed in that slide is that after the chest dressing around the chest tube you have a secondary strapping so give a loop and then put plaster again at the level of the iliac crest so by chance if there is a pull on the tube the movement will be at the level of secondary strapping your primary chest tube insertion site is protected by this second layer while transportation we will not clamp the chest tube uh, is answered interval or time when drainage should be emptied yes she answered that in 24 hours you drain about a liter so when massive effusion is there you drain 6 700 and then you clamp the tube you wait for few hours then you drain another 6 700 and wait the reason is that the lung is collapsed and you suddenly expand the lung patients go into re expansion pulmonary edema uh, what are the different types of chest tube well she has shown a picture please refer to that could be used sidex she has answered that no we can't use sidex uh, what is the maximum amount of fluid we can drain in 24 hours is answered why to place the bag at chest level is answered a uh, curved why do we use curved suture well curved suture or straight suture is your choice but it has to be a cutting needle because a uh, round body needle will not go through the skin um next question is how do you choose epidural as rop or bup well this is a uh, individual choice this is done by anesthetist so there has to be a combination of non narc of local anesthetic and a uh, narcotic analgesic sometimes we use either sometimes we use both 
uh, do we use DVT pump for a patient who has undergone CAPG? Yes, we do. Bolini gel or patch? Well, you can use gel also. You can use patch also. My message is regarding pain relief is what Dr. Mohan showed a slide. No size, one size does not fit all. Don't go by a standard of care that I can only give two tablets of crocin or not. For A, for Arvind, two tablets of crocin may be more than enough. For Bilal, two tablets may be nothing. He may need more. So please individualize the treatment. End point is patient should not have pain. What we tell patient is try and press your wound area. Even then, if you don't have pain, that is our definition of good pain relief. Wound care, yes, it's important. Somebody has asked, please tell us about diet in chylothorax. Diet in chylothorax is a different area. We have not gone into that detail. So I'm not opening this area. When to mobilize the patient after post-op? Well, we get our patients into the ICU. And as soon as they are out of anesthesia, maybe three, four, five, six hours, we make them sit on the chair by the side of the table. But before we do that, we always check that the blood pressure is normal. We check that the air entry, et cetera, is okay. And after that, we assist them, but not suddenly. You first make them sit. You first make them sit with legs hanging down. Make them move the leg. You have to avoid postural hypotension from occurring. What are the physiotherapy management in chest surgery? It's answered by Dr. Deepika. Uh, I want to do the program. A lot of people have asked about how they can approach this program. Well, we'll be reaching out to you uh, uh, through your emails. Please keep check on your emails. Um, according to Ms. Deepika, if saturation decreases from 98 to 90, then it is a risk. What does it mean? Well, what she tried to explain was uh, that when a patient exercises, see, if we exercise, even at rest, my oxygen is okay. And when I exercise, my oxygen is okay because my lungs have extra capacity and they compensate and get extra oxygen. Somebody has a borderline capacity, at rest he's okay, but when he exercises, his saturation starts falling. It just is a warning sign that this patient has a borderline kind of lung function. Now in that patient, if you remove a part of the lung, then you are going to ask for trouble. So we use this as a means of detecting whether the patient will be able to tolerate lung resection or not. The next question is a lot of people have asked about e-certificates. They will reach you within a week's time on your emails. Please keep check on your email. We'll be sending you e-certificates in your name signed by all of us. Uh, okay. Kindly tell us the difference between the normal spirometer and Cox spirometer is by Pooja Niyogi. Pooja Niyogi has asked a lot of questions. I'll ask Dr. Deepika. We have your details, Pooja. Dr. Deepika will get in touch with you and will answer all your questions one is to one because we are running short of time now. If aggressive feeding help to the malnourished, what? how does it help? Well, malnourishment is one of the major in effect, uh, which affects the uh, tissue healing, wound healing, and all kinds of post-op complications. And nowhere do we see more often than in patients with prolonged chronic TB empyema who come absolutely like bony structures. We admit them, we feed them through rice tube, we build them up, and then we operate. They have a successful outcome. So correction of malnutrition is very important. Uh, somebody has asked this question, I thought robots were made to reduce the need for men. You said that you go and sit on the robot and then what is the fun? Well, I don't think robot was made to replace me. Robot is a tool which allows you to carry out the procedures by minimal access method in a very fine way. I don't think human beings will ever, ever go out of the operation theater. Ultimately, the control will and must and should remain in our control. So robot is a slave. We, the surgeons, are the master. We use it to deliver better care. Uh, the next question is again by Pooja. Anthracotic uh, patches are a common finding in bronchoscopy. Can they be reversed? Well, Pooja, most of the time, these patches cannot be reversed. I showed you the picture of a black lung. Once we have black deposits occurring in the lungs, they cannot be 
removed. What is incentive spirometry? Uh, uh, when you give incentive to a patient, so in that device with balls, you tell a patient, please raise the first ball, please raise the second ball, please raise. So you are giving an incentive, a target to the patient. So that is what is incentive. Spirometry is very, very, very important. Why biopsy is compulsory is a question asked by somebody with the daphilia risa. Well, biopsy is the final confirmatory test to know what the disease is. Without biopsy, our diagnosis is never complete. No cancer operation can be done without biopsy. I think these are, there are a lot of overlap in the questions, but uh, these are the major ones. We will, we have all these questions, etc. We look at these and if we do find somebody with a very uh, specific question, we'll reach out to you by uh, email. Now, before I give my final comment. Now we've made a change. Normally the, 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 the person who's conducting the webinar gives a vote of thanks. So that way Neha should have been giving vote of thanks, but I have taken away this responsibility from her because I wanted to personally thank the hundreds of brothers and sisters who have joined from the country. So that's why I have snatched it from Neha. But before I do that, I would like to request my colleagues uh, Dr. Bilal, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Sukram, Deepika, Neha, if any one of them wants to give any last comment, anything. And similarly, uh, Mr. Binod, Sister Sandhya, Sister Jensi, Sister Mini, Priscilla, Sister Charita, any one of you, maybe one, one line final comments, and then I'll give the vote of thanks. Bilal. I think he's not here. Harsh, are you there? No. Uh, Mohan? Yeah, it's really an uh, exciting moment for all of us uh, because uh, it's a that, that huge uh, uh, enthusiastic participant who made successful this program. And uh, I feel the program went very well. And thank you so much for all the participants, the Madanta, the nursing uh, the leaders and everyone who actually participated in this, uh, who made this program a grand success. Thank you. Uh, Deepika? Yes, sir. You're not audible. Hello? Am I yeah, audible? go ahead. Yeah. So we want as the biggest institute of chest surgery to excel in all aspects like surgery, nursing, and respiratory therapy, which is very close to my heart, and we won't make it on the top of the line. Thank okay. Yeah. Aneha, any comments from you? Uh, sir, it's the beginning of thoracic surgery, nursing speciality, so it's a proud moment. Okay. Uh, over to uh, all of you, Pracharita, Mini, Jensi, Sandhya, Vinodji, any, any final comments before I propose... Sandeep, anyone? Sir, I am proud to be part of our thoracic surgery ward under Dr. Arvind, under the guidance no, of Dr. No, Arvind. it's please, nothing under somebody. We are all part of a family. We are a part of a team. Yeah. Everybody is equal. We know. Yeah, sir, we are so happy, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much to each one of you. We know. Yeah. So, as I said in my opening comments itself, this knowledge, what we have gained today is basically twofold. One is that this knowledge is to share and this knowledge is to practice. So I would request each one of you who attended the program to put into practice whatever you have learned here. Otherwise, the ultimate purpose of this program is not I mean, fulfilled. So please practice one or two or minimum three things. I mean, what you've learned from here has to be put into your daily practice, whether you have a thoracic department or not, because these can be used. I mean, one is to share and one is your personal practice. So that will definitely make our patients safe in the hospital. Very, very apt comments, uh, you know, very apt comments. In fact, when we had this discussion in our department and we started planning, a clear cut message from all of us to all of us was that we will focus only on the practical aspects. And you would have seen from the slides that we didn't put any theory at all. Everything that was shown by all the presenters was only the practical 
points to be used in the ward so so very rightly said you know that if people start putting in practice what we have shared with them today i think it has a potential to make a change we always have this philosophy that anyone who attends our webinar should get some should go away with some practical tip taken so that next day when he or she manages a patient he can do it better he can do it differently and if all of you can imbibe something and bring about a change in your practice come tomorrow well we'll feel that whatever efforts uh, department of nursing at pre institutions and the center for chest surgery has done it's been worth it well ladies and gentlemen now i come towards the concluding part uh, i have taken this from neha and i'm going to propose this vote of thanks myself because i want to i'm truly overwhelmed by the massive massive response from across the country i personally called up uh, many principals and the kind of responses they gave they called me they told me sir our faculty is attending our students are attending i mean i was amazed by the love affection shown by people so first of all foremost i start by thanking each one of the attendees over 2000 from across the country and each one of the registered people over 4600 from across the country for their love affection and i would repeat what mr vinod said to at least the participants that please this will be available on the youtube and the link will be sent to all of you on your email you can visit and re uh, hear re see any lecture at any point of time and if you put it into practice it will be good do consider thoracic nurses network of india as a possibility this group could be the starting point so thanks to all of you delegates from across the country next i need to thank the department of nursing at uh, medanta gurugram medanta patna and medanta lucknow mr vinod since the time i met him first time when i moved to this hospital in december 2020 it's been an amazing experience meeting him as also meeting sandhya jensi mini and uh, the other team members the first time i met him and i discussed that we want to do this program their immediate answer was sir it's a great idea just tell us what we what help you need and we are there and i must say from 7 am to midnight every time i have called any one of them they've responded so vinod and your team a very very uh, personal thanks to all of you my thanks to priscilla who's the uh, nursing director at uh, medanta lucknow i've met her personally and uh, this time we talked on phone again full of warmth and uh, the way we have participation from various areas in and around lucknow i think is possible only because of her involvement thanks priscilla so charita i have not met face to face i'll be meeting her in the second week of march when we go to patna to launch our opd there but it's been a pleasure and good experience interacting with all of you with you and your team and thank you very much and similarly mr jobin at indor and all others in the uh, nursing systems at all the five units of medanta from the institute of chest surgery a very warm and personal thanks to all of you uh, as i said we run lung care foundation as a social arm and uh, this zoom platform which we had was catering to only 300 people but the zoom platform that we had at lung care foundation was catering to 1000 people so we decided to host it on the platform of lung care foundation and i would like dr carmine hamid and tulika to please switch on their cameras come come in front uh, hamid is the one who's been managing the entire registration so all the registration links etc the various emails which have come to you they've all been managed uh, behind the scenes by amit dr tul armin has been assisting him and all the questions which are coming to him she has been looking at the q and a box along with tulika is tulika there karmin uh, sir uh, she is not here no okay no problem so along with tulika she, yeah there comes amit amit is in srinagar i would like to tell you that we are in delhi 
Priscilla is in Lucknow, Sucharita is in Patna, Dr. Harsh is currently in Jammu, Dr. Sukram is in Jaipur, Hamid is managing the whole show from Srinagar, you can see from his clothes, he's in Srinagar, Dr. Kamin is at the Lung Care Foundation office in Delhi. So thanks, Hamid, uh, you've done a wonderful job, and of course you have more things to do because feedback forms, e-certificates, I'm sure. So thanks to you, thanks to Carmen, thanks to Tulika, and all others in the Lung Care Foundation team. Yeah, Neha also in the Lung Care Foundation office. Uh, and lastly, I come to my, my department, my colleagues in the department, Dr. Bilal, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Sukram, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Vivek and Sumit are not here because uh, they are also traveling. Dr. Sumit is in Indore, Dr. Vivek is in another city and we have two uh, residents here, Dr. Manan and Dr. Sarab, who are actually taking care of patients in the ward. Dr. Deepika, our physiotherapist, uh, Neha, Priyanka, and Prerna, our nursing coordinators. Thanks to all of you. And last but not the least, my support staff in the department, uh, the manager academics in our department, Mrs. Charu, who actually is the backbone of all such academic programs that we do. Uh, she's not here, but I would like to make a mention that it's her attention to details which sees that every program goes through smoothly. We have other support staff, Srinivas, Tanika, and Annie in the department who've helped me out. Uh, special mention of uh, Neha, because uh, the way it, this, this is actually actually started because of her pestering, sir, we have to do a program, sir, we have to do a program. So one day we said, okay, fix the date and come back. So suddenly she said, sir, how about 19th February? And that's how a couple of two weeks back, this date got fixed and we thought, shall we be able to do it? But I think God was kind, all of you were kind and we were able to do it. So special thanks to you, Neha. And last but not the least, nothing can move, nothing can be successful without blessings from God. So always, eternally grateful to God for all his blessings. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been amazing experience interacting with all of you. I wish you good health, good luck, stay happy, stay healthy, good luck, and goodbye.